Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the March 23rd, 2023 meeting of the Fiscal Management Committee, the sexiest committee. Uh, my name is Lynn Harris. I am uh, the proud chair of this committee, and I'm going to start by introducing my board colleagues to my left. Hi, Rebecca Smondrowski, District 2. To my right. Good morning, buenos dias. Grace Rivera Oven, uh, District 1. And so as we get started, I'll just have staff that are here quickly uh, introduce himself. Morning, everybody. Rob Riley, Associate Superintendent of Finance. And so just to get started, are there any uh, issues, concerns with the informational summary from our last meeting? No, ma'am. Okay. So the first item on our agenda today um, our uh, category 12 expenses, which is a part of our job on the fiscal management committee is to um, manage the annual reporting that we need to do. And one of the things I will highlight that Mr. Riley will be covering uh, over the past several months, you've heard um, some mention during our uh, board meetings, taking a look at the monthly financial reports and looking at um, the projections and predictions about the possible end of year balance for our group insurance funds. And um, those were predictions and projections. It was looking like we might possibly end the year um, with those funds um, not, I mean, with a negative balance. So we're going to go over that a little bit in depth. And I will uh, just uh, turn it over to Mr. Riley. But first, I will have our chief operating officer introduce himself. Uh, thank you, Ms. Harris. Uh, Brian Hall, chief operating officer. It's great to be here today, and I look forward to the conversation. All right. Mr. Riley, kick us off. All right. So the first item here is Category 12 expenditures. Um, so Category 12 expenditures we bring to the Fiscal Management <coughs> Committee two times a year now, where we're looking at projections between now and the end of the year, and then it's September, where we look at where we fell between budget and actual. Um, so this, this meeting uh, mainly focuses on the two largest areas of, of Category 12, which are our pension expense as well as our EBP expense, as, as Ms. Harris mentioned. Um, so I think we're going to talk about uh, pension first. Um, well, actually, next slide, please. Um, that that's the history. So we've been doing this since 2012, um, and and one of the reasons why we do it is because the, of the size of the expenditures within Category 12. So we do do our monthly uh, financial monitoring report, as, as you mentioned, uh, but this we kind of dig a little deeper to see where we're at with these two, particularly these two areas. Category 12 also, in, in addition to pension and health benefits, it includes uh, Social Security, insurance, workers' comp, and tuition reimbursement, as well as other. Uh, benefit-related items. Next slide. Uh, so we'll be talking about uh, the summary of our strategy uh, and the desired pension funding level. We'll also talk about the uh, estimated amounts of annual employer contributions. This is where it has an effect on our operating budget because in Category 12 is what we pay based on actuarial amounts uh, towards our pension. Um, some of the other major factors that affect the pension contributions over the next five years. And then we're going to look at EBP, specifically our active and retiree, retiree group insurance funds and the projected year end balance. Um, as we mentioned, we've been looking at this very closely over the last few months, over the last few years, actually. So next slide. Um, so employer pension contributions. Uh, so I, I wanted to kind of give you a historical idea of where we're at with this. So back in uh, FY14, 15, and 16, we were below 80% funded. So when you look at your pension funding, uh, you, you want to make sure you're at a certain level so you, you don't endanger not being able to pay current year expenses. Um, I don't know exactly what that level is, but we knew we wanted to be over 80 percent. So uh, back a few years ago, we started uh, contributing more than that actual re actuarial required contribution. Um, and actually, last year, we actually got to uh, 90 percent funded, which was that was our, our you know real goal. Um, but as you know, we had a horrible, you know, uh, the economy took a turn for the worst the year before or last year. So we went from 90% funded to a little over 80. Um, so we had gotten to that level, uh, but then it's gone down a little. So one of the reasons why, you know, we want to be at that more than 80, you know, uh, 90 preferably, is because we want to create that cushion. And as it says in the letter, um, 
typically financial downturns place upward pressure on our employee contributions. So the fact that we got it at that level, even though it was one of the worst years in history, I think it was the fourth worst when you look at S&P 500 in, in history, uh, we were able to maintain a level of 80% and we weren't in any danger. Um, so that, that's why we, we want to make sure that we're monitoring the funding level for this. Um, and it does protect us from future spikes in difficult economic times, which, which we just saw come to fruition last year. Um, so also in uh, pension, I just want to give you an update because uh, you know you've heard in the news about um, you know uh, Signature Bank, um, Silicon Valley Bank, Credit Suisse. There's a, a few different. Uh, banks that are, you know, have come to the news. Um, and just to let you know that our exposure is very minimal um, and we don't expect any, uh, any bad outcomes to the pension fund for that. So I just wanted to let you know that. Um, so the pension, when we, when we talk about the pension fund, when I say 90% funded, so we're looking at two things. We're looking at what's in that total uh, bucket, the, the amount of assets, and then we look at the actuarial uh, determined pension liability. And that's, that's where you got, that's where we were over 90, now we're still over 80. Um, but just to let you know, so even though uh, this year things were looking a little more optimistic, uh, but now coming into this third quarter, uh, you know, is yet to be seen, I guess. Um, we were looking at a positive, and we still think there's a chance to have a positive uh, uh, net um, investment return, we're still, it's still to be determined. Um, but our overall balance, we were at two, billion and 37 million. Now we're at 2.6 billion. So um, just to give you an idea of where we're at. So our actual assets have actually increased. So um, we'll see at the end whether that affects our percentage. So when, when the actuaries do their work, they're looking at uh, a lot of different factors and assumptions, they call it. So some of them are salary adjustments. Some are, are change in the, the size of our workforce. Uh, investment performance, which I just mentioned. So um, in addition to looking at what the actual rate was, the, the actuaries use uh, assumed rate. So we always had been at 7% um, based on the board investment trustees' input. And when we look around our uh, uh, you know, other peers, uh, we, we dropped that down to 6.75 to make that, you know, you want to try to make that reasonable. And the way that the actuaries do that, they do a five-year um, st study every five years to look at our assumptions. So one will be coming up in the next year or two. We did one three or four years ago. Other assumptions are, are mortality rates, turnover rates, and inflation. So, you know, these last couple of years, we've seen uh, changes in all of these things, really. So when they do that five-year study, they're looking over 30 years. So even though, you know, we have some changes in the past year or two, they're looking out 30 years. So to just give you an idea of what some of those assumptions are. Next slide. Oops, okay. Uh, so uh, before we get into EBP, um, let me see if I had anything else on pension. Um, no, I guess that, that was about it. So any questions on pension before I move on to uh, one of the things you'll notice that we are taking into account is Blueprint, right? So Blueprint, you know, is making us revisit some of our salary assumptions. And when I, you know, because there's increases in salaries due to Blueprint. Uh, but again, we'll see what the actuaries determine because they're looking 30 years out. Um, so even though Blueprint has a, a timeline um, and we're seeing increases or required increases over the next, you know, five to 10 years, they're looking at 30 years. So, uh, well, you know, when we come back or when we do our uh, uh, annual financial report, we'll let you know what those, uh, that actual report determines. So, uh, if there's no questions, any on pensioner? Are you going to describe this? Yeah, now no, I'll do this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so our active and retiree group insurance funds. So we've been talking about this uh, lately, and um, one of the big areas here is you can see when you look at the beginning fund balance for 23, where we ended on June 30th, we were at $35 million in fund balance. The year before, we were actually about 50, and the year before that, we were about 60. Um, so we have been speaking about that declining fund balance within EBP. Some of that was related to COVID uh, with, uh, 
uh, folks going to the doctors and getting procedures done later on. Um, but some of that is just inflationary increases that we, you know, haven't been keeping up with. Uh, we did put in $30 million last year uh, to try to boost that, that fund balance. So we're not in a situation where we have to ask the county for additional funds during the year. Um, we ended up not getting that $30 million. In this year's budget, we actually have $15 million um, to get us right-sized, as well as uh, $5 million in inflationary costs. So every year, we try to anticipate what that inflation factor is going to be. Normally, uh, inflation for health insurance is about 5 percent, and then for uh, pharmacy, it's about 8 percent. Uh, so this is where we stand, you know, as of right now. So. Uh, we're expecting a loss of fund balance in the actives, um, about 12.1 million. So we're going to uh, projecting that we'll end the year with 3.1 million, um, and then for retirees, uh, 1 million there. So uh, we did uh, see benefits to changing from Care First to Cigna. Um, there was benefits right off the bat of uh, 5 million dollars in administrative fees, and then the rest is um, a reduced increase to. Um, our, our rates, our claims. So, as I mentioned, you know, normally we see that 5% increase. This year it would have been about 8, but we were able to reduce that by switching from Care First to Cigna. One of the benefits of, you know, going out to for an RFP every couple of years. So, um, so that's where we're looking right now. Um, one of the things, uh, and I think I mentioned in the last board meeting, when we look at it on a monthly basis, our rebates have actually come in a little higher. So that's kind of helped us as a little. But this does take that into account as well, too. So this shows where we would end uh, if we get the budget that, you know, that we've asked for, um, we'll see an increase in $15 million to help um, both of those, those funds right there, so the retiree and the active. Um, it, and, uh, you know, I, I would say that there's different philosophies on how much you should have in fund balance. We feel a minimum of 15 uh, would be would be warranted because we're spending an active, we're spending about $40 million a month, and then in retirees, uh, 10 to 12 million dollars a month. So normally, like you know, from a personal, uh, when you're budgeting, you want to have a couple of months extra in the bank to cover those, you know, fluctuations. So we're really not doing that here. So we're thinking, you know, although we look at it on a daily basis, we feel like at a minimum we want at least 15 to 20 million dollars in combined fund balance there. So what you're talking about here, you have, um, you've broken the funds out into two, the active employees and the retirees, but you're also kind of talking about in the aggregate for both funds. Correct, yeah. So um, when you said, ideally, we would want to end the year with fund balance of about $15 million, right. you were talking about combined in the two combined, funds. Combined, yes, I'm sorry. So what you're projecting at this point, again... We are we are we're still got another quarter to go in the fiscal year. We are projecting about four point one million. Correct. That's okay. right. Yeah, and then uh, fifteen to twenty million. So the fifteen million dollars that's part of our budget request would add to that. We'd be in that range combined. Yeah. Just um, point of clarification. I thought this change from Care First to Cigna was a ten million dollar savings. Yeah. So, so the the five million uh, is in administrative fees, uh, which that already takes into account that reduction. Um, so, if we didn't, that those would be five million increased, and then the other five million is claims costs, which we'll see uh, on a month to month basis. And and uh, that because our employees will be paying more of the. No, no, nothing to do. Nothing to do with cost share. This is just the negotiated rates through the RFP. Um, so cost share doesn't change. Change. Um, uh, 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 when, when you <laughs> the, the amount you put down for uh, um, your. Uh, my deductibles. deductibles, yeah. My payments. <laughs> so so no, nothing changed with our plan itself, and nothing changed with the cost share, because that's all part of the plan. Um, it's really just our overall rates that are negotiated with the doctors in the in the, the network. And, and can I just add to that, too, because um, there seems to be some confusion out there. When we go out for an RFP for our uh, benefits plan, we, ha we have our plan, and then people bid on providing services uh, coverage for that plan. So the plan itself didn't change. The amount that the um, employees are paying didn't change. Uh, that all stayed the same. And then the uh, insurance companies just bid on who wants to uh, you know, service that particular plan that we already have in place.
Is that spending affordability guideline? Yep, and I'm going to ask uh, Tom Klausing, Executive Director, to come down and speak to that. Good morning, everyone. Guidelines. So each time this year, each year this time, we come before the board to discuss what the county goes through in terms of spending affordability guidelines. Um, the spending affordability guidelines is a process where the county sets an aggregate budget level for its operating budget. Uh, as it approaches its budget season in the spring. Um, and the first slide as it comes up here, uh, according to the county code, any agency requesting more funding in its operating budget than the council's spending affordability guidelines requires it to submit by March 31st a prioritized list of expenditure reductions that would bring the budget to the uh, amount within the spending affordability guidelines. So if we go to that next slide, that's what I basically summarized right there. So it requires an agency like MCPS, four agencies in county. Uh, those agencies are MCPS, Montgomery College, National Capital Park and Planning Commission and county government. If any of the budgets that are submitted by those agencies exceed the spend affordability guidelines, the agency is required to submit itemized reductions that would bring its budget to that, that guideline level. So if we go to the next slide. So each year the council sets the aggregate SAG or spend affordability guidelines um, ceiling in, in January or this year it's in February for those four agencies. It's our tax supported budget. Uh, and that you've maybe heard that term before. Our tax supported budget is our total budget, but excludes restricted grants and our enterprise and special revenue funds. The SAG allocation is based on our maintenance of effort. Uh, calculation or contribution from the county and assumes no change in state aid or in the use of fund balance to fund our, our operating budget each year. Next slide, please. So the county notes in this SAG process that the SAG allocations are illustrative and not final. It's really up to the discretion of the council itself in the appropriations process to determine how much money each agency, the, of those four agencies, each, what each agency is to receive. And then a recent change in the, in the code allows the fact that the SAG allocations do not, incre do not reflect any increase in state aid or the use of fund balance in setting the SAG allocations. And so when we look at the amount, we can account for those differences. So the table in the next page, please, will show us um, how those numbers come out. So when you pass uh, the tentatively adopted budget on February 23rd, your tax supported amount for MCPS was 2,700 million, I'm going to call that 2.7 billion um, for MCPS for 2024. Then the, uh, I'm sorry, um, let me start over again. The SAG allocation that the council passed in February was for 2.7 billion for MCPS. And that is our maintenance of effort level, and I'll discuss that in a little bit. The budget that you passed on February 23rd was $3.028 billion, uh, exceeding the, the SAG allocation by $307 million. So the fact that our state aid increased by $69.5 million and the fact that we're using $25 million of MCPS fund balance to fund the 2024 budget, that those two amounts reduce the actual amount that the board's budget 
is over the SAG allocation by $213 million. So let me stop there and, and explain that when the council was passing its SAG, the total SAG amount for the 2024 budget, it looked at five options that the staff, council staff had put forward. One option was to show no increase in the county's 24 operating budget over 2023, zero percent change. The one of the options was to increase the council, the county's budget by 7%, which was based on the amount of inflation for, um, based on 22, FY22 inflation. So a 7% increase was the high end. And so the last, the, the option that the council ended up picking was not 0%, was not 7%, but about a 2% increase. Uh, and that's based on uh, the proper, the personal property income increase for uh, 2022. That's what the council believes, the council staff believed was affordable for the county's operating budget for 2024. So when the council takes that total and allocates it, it looks at MCPS and the college and immediately funds us and the college at our maintenance of effort level. So for FY 2024, our maintenance of effort level, because of our enrollment drop the last couple years due to the pandemic, would actually allow the county to fund us at 40 million below FY 2023. And, and we, all, we all know what, what, what impact that would have on a, on our school district. So when the council has um, funded us using the total SAG allocation at maintenance of effort, it allows large increases for county government of about 8% and park and planning commission at 7%. So those are the SAG allocations for the four agencies that were approved by, by uh, the council in February. So it is our responsibility to respond by March 31st to a SAG allocation, which is basically so far below what the board's budget request was in February. Um, and that difference is the $213 million um, that shows on this table. So what you will be doing if we could go to the next slide, I, that basically show, uh, explains what I just went over. Um, but what you're doing on Tuesday's board meeting is a resolution that authorizes the superintendent, as we've done uh, for the last decade or more, to send the required letter to the county council describing what a, a reduction of $213 million to your budget would mean. And basically, that, that letter would say reductions of this magnitude would be extremely difficult. And if necessary, we would attempt to avoid decreases that directly impact MCPS students, classrooms, and schools where possible. And it goes on to say, I am not recommending specific reductions at this time. So to meet the county code requirement, the superintendent will send that letter by March 31st after you all um, would, would, on Tuesday's board meeting, pass that resolution. So that's the process for this year. It's the same uh, that it's been for the last decade or more. And uh, so that's why we're here today briefing you, the Fiscal Management Committee, on the spending affordability guidelines process. You mentioned there were five options. I only heard three that the county had. Give me a minute. Oh, I just I'd be was happy wondering. To but, pull out. but the one that they chose, it was a 2% um, property tax increase, correct? Correct. So the correct. one option was. No, no increase. Correct. One option was um, increase the budget by seven percent. I think. Correct. Let me jump to that one. So that's uh, based on the estimated rate of inflation for 2022. Mm -hmm. The one they agreed to was the estimated increase in personal income for 2022, and that's a 2.16 percent increase. 
Another option was the estimated increase in the employment cost index for the state and local governments for 2022, and that's 4.6%. And then the last increase was based on agency allocations estimated by executive staff in the December 2022 fiscal plan update, 2.83%. So they chose to go with a 2.16% increase. Um, and just to clarify, th this is the council looking at, um, you know, projections and predictions. There aren't any hard dollars really on the table at that point, and they're not making determinations about uh, about funding sources. They're just looking at revenue projections. You're, you're absolutely correct. They're making, they're, it's an economic outlook, basically. At this point in time, they're saying that um, without increasing taxes in the county, the county operating budget for 2024 could increase by 2.16%. But as you know, the county executive on March 15th recommended a 10 cent increase um, for funding education in the county's uh, operating budget for 2024. So that really is a separate and distinct action separate from the spending affordability guidelines. Yep. And that was an increase to property taxes because that's the only taxing authority that the county council possesses. Correct. And that increase of the 10 uh, percent. Ten cents. Ten cents. Ten cents. Ten cents. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you're going to say it right. Yeah. <laughs> the ten cents increase, that would give us, if that were to pass, a revenue of about, what, $294 million about? Every, everything. But because it would go to the schools, correct? That's correct. It would only go to schools, mm -hmm. and it would allow the county executive's recommendation <laughs> would fund our local contribution uh, at the board's request, less about seven million and change. Mm -hmm. So there's that shortfall still in the county executive's recommendation of a little under eight million dollars. Right, the difference. Okay, thank you. All right. Fun times. All right, so we are ready to move on to our operating budget update. We just got a little bit, I think, of a yeah, of a four, of a oh, little segue yeah. talking about uh, the uh, county uh, executive's uh, March fifteenth uh, presentation, where he mentioned, you know, seeking the county council's approval for a uh, one percent or one. 10 cent cents. increase in the property tax rate. So um, moving on. And I think we got a, a, a PowerPoint for this as well too. All right, thank you. Next slide. Uh, so just a little bit of review as, as we talked when, when you uh, adopted or tentatively adopted your budget. Uh, this budget was built on the board uh, strategic plan academic excellence, well-being and family engagement, as well as professional and operational excellence, and the Board, uh, board of Education priorities listed there, as well as the, the budget themes of innovation, instruction, and acceleration. That's how we built the budget. Um, next slide. Um, and this just uh, shows um, what happened between February 23rd and March 15th. So your budget was $296 million above the prior year budget, a 10.1% increase. Uh, based on the county executive's recommendation last week, uh, we would be getting uh, a 288.5 million. So um, as Mr. Klausing mentioned, $7.5 million, uh, less than what the original request was, uh, but a substantial increase of 9.9% compared to our prior year budget. Next slide. Um, so this just, uh, kind of shows, uh, you know, where we're at with the different funding sources. So the change that we just mentioned is our local contribution there. Uh, the BOE request was 230.7 million, and we're getting, uh, assuming that the, the tax rate goes through, we would be getting $223.3 million there. Uh, no changes in our state uh, revenues, and as we discussed when you guys adopted, 74.2 million for foundation and uh, 
a decrease actually in 4.7 in, in blueprint from the uh, from prior year. Federal revenue is the $0.3 million, and that's our title grants. That does not include ESSER, which at this point, uh, through February 28th, we have about $131 million remaining in ESSER 3. Uh, there was a slight change there in enterprise and other revenue, um, which we'll discuss on the next slide. And then this budget um, assumes that we're going to be going back to using $25 million in our fund balance. Last year, we increased that to $35 million to balance the budget. Um, so uh, this slide just reiterates the $7.5 million um, shortfall. Um, and the, the, the budget uh, that the county executive put forth also uh, put in a recommendation to include $1 million for a lease payment uh, for the new Stone Street Warehouse location uh, with funding provided for that uh, accordingly, but still $7.5 million gap. Um, and then the, the uh, special revenue fund I was talking about, that slight decrease there. So we do have a, a special revenue fund, uh, our cable television fund, and that is funded through franchise fees. And then the county um, actually, you know, saw that there was a decrease in that. So they recommended this uh, decrease in our budget uh, accordingly. Um, and then as we mentioned, this budget does assume the 10 cent property tax uh, increase for the sole purpose of uh, funding our, our budget, the board's budget. Uh, next slide. Um, so this, uh, so we're, since we're talking about revenue, just to uh, show here, we are 93% funded by the county and the state, um, uh, and federal 3%. I, I'd just like to kind of clarify too, we don't include ESSER in that. So ESSER, we, because we consider that non-recurring, uh, we keep that separate. This is our recurring funds, and it's, it's normally 3% on a year-to-year -year basis. At one point at the height, uh, ESSER was 14% of our budget, just to give you an idea of uh, what that cliff is that we'll be facing yeah. over the next year or so. And then fund, uh, fund balance at $25 million represents 1% of our funding sources. Could I just add real quickly, uh, in, in looking at this table historically, you would find that this amount that we get from the state has increased, and, and to no surprise, it's due to blueprint funding. Um, so that 29%, if you look in past years, was 27-ish percent previously. So, so you're starting to see that shift, um, uh, and, and with the county amount actually going down somewhat due to that. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just some, uh, we just wanted to bring up some key milestones again. So uh, in March last week, we found out about the county executive's proposed budget. Uh, next would be our March to May timeframe. And what's going to be happening is on April 11th um, and April 13th, there'll be uh, uh, public hearings for the county council budget uh, at 1.30 and 7 p.m. And then there'll be work sessions, education committee work sessions on April 19th, 26th, and May 4th. Uh, then on, the, on May 25th, the county council is going to vote on their budget, um, and then it'll come back to our board um, on June 6th for approval. So that, that should be all we had on the uh, current status of the operating budget. Any questions on that? Or? Thanks very Thank much. You. It's still a work in progress, and we will just keep going. Um, okay, next up, I, we have a CIP update. I think Mr. Adams will be joining us. I'm sure he loves our little conversations about the CIP. I feel like there should be music playing. I know, <laughs> I know, as he, as he rocks Swing to the table, music. as he walks to the table. So, um, and then, as uh, we're all aware, um, the school system, MCPS, was asked to, uh, in January, or was it January or February, <clears throat> as is a typical process, to present to the uh, Ed and Culture Committee um, non-recommended reductions to our CIP request. And then last week, there was an additional write-down to the county CIP we are addressing. So take it away, Mr. Adams. 
Sure. So, yes, just for a little context, you know, the uh, the typical process, you know, does include the non-recommended reductions. Non-recommended reductions are associated with the county executive's budget. Um, that budget ultimately goes over to county council. Um, Education and Culture Committee reviews it, and that's they ask us to look at our CIP for ways to align with the county executive's budget. So, so we went through that process. We 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 uh, we started that. That was our presentation at spring amendments at the board around what those non-recommended reductions would look like. Um, we started to have those conversations with the uh, Education and Culture Committee, as you mentioned last Tuesday, I believe it, Wednesday. We we met and started to go through project by project, identified which ones were part of the non-recommended reductions, which ones obviously were not. Just talked about the the critical nature of, of every every one of the projects. Uh, certainly, the Education and Culture Committee weighed in on on some of them in terms of you know is there ways to restore. Um, and, and restore is a different, difficult word because you know a lot of people look at it as a, a school system cut. It's not a school system cut. We're, we're offering up suggestions. Um, so when they look at it to, to restore, basically what they're saying is, are we going to look for ways to fund this but take away from other projects throughout the county possibly? That could be transportation. That could be recreation or whatever. So I just wanted to you know put that caveat out there. Um, so, so it went well, we, we, we talked through went line item by line item. I mean, there was, there was projects like the ADA program that they felt very strongly about um, not cutting that program and keeping the momentum there. Um, they felt very strongly about some of the, the larger projects. Um, I think Damascus was one that really jumped out with the two-year delay, you know, feeling very strongly that that project, because it does have obviously infrastructure elements, program elements, as well as capacity associated adjacent clusters, that that was a, a really important one. But at the same time, um, you know, I, I would say the, the Education and Culture Committee acknowledged the fact that the day before, uh, the county executive made an amendment to his initial budget. And that amendment uh, essentially is resulting in a second round of non-recommended reductions. That second round of non-recommended reductions, which, which I don't believe I've ever experienced before. I mean, it's typically just been one. The second round came out. Um, and right now it sits at $31.5 million uh, that, that uh, we are asked to uh, close an additional gap from a budget that would bring the total up to over $90 million of, of the board's request. Um, I would say we're, we're working through that. The challenge is much of those dollars are in fiscal year 26 and fiscal year 27. Um, which, which does make it really challenging in terms of, of what you can reduce or what you can move. The reason it's challenging is we just don't have that many projects in, in the out years of our CIP. Um, once we finish the elementary schools uh, that, that open up this summer, um, we don't have elementary schools identified in the next six years of the CIP. We, we have uh, design funds for Eastern and Piney Branch, but no construction funds. Uh, we have you know, no middle schools after uh, uh, Nielsville is completed, and, and obviously you know, once Eastern has some, some construction funding. But there's just absolutely nothing in those out years um, that you can necessarily reduce or delay other than the high schools we've already been talking about. So the high schools we've already been talking about, obviously, are, are you know, the big ones, right? Woodward, Northwood, Crown, um, Damascus, uh, Wooten, Magruder. All of those projects are the ones that are, they have expenditures in the, the, the 26, 27 years, and, and we're looking at all other ways. I would just say the alternatives are, are then just stepping back and looking at our systemic programs. Um, just to give you context, if, if we were to say, all right, leave all those big projects alone and just look at other areas, uh, we'd have to halt, let's say, for example, our HVAC replacement program for two years in order to meet this. So I don't think anyone has any interest in doing that as well, because that's obviously a critical component of our schools. So I, I do think this is going to be a difficult CIP session. Um, you know, it's going to be difficult because there's a lot of moving pieces here uh, around the budget. There's a lot of bills that are being introduced. Um, you, you know, there's a lot of information that's that's sort of flowing in terms of revenue. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we're we're asked to provide you know additional you know 31.5 million, which I would actually say is closer to 36 million because they're assuming some credits and and some extra money that doesn't necessarily exist at the moment. So it's closer to 36 million that we're we're trying to overcome. Um, 
but yes, unfortunately, that's that's the current state. We are prepared to talk about it a little bit in, in greater detail to talk about specific projects at the next two next Tuesday's business full board business meeting, um, because this is brand new to us. You know, we're still running numbers and trying to figure out what what ultimately can fit within those expenditure years. Um, but we will prepare to come back to the board and explain what that second round of non recommended reductions looks like. One caveat, though, I think is also important is that with an amendment to the county executive's budget, it does allow for another round of public comments. Um, you know, public comments typically they they are they're performed at the council level at the first round, but since there is an amendment, there there is um, I believe by law a requirement for a second round of public comments. So um, there would be an opportunity to really you know get messaging out to different communities um, just so that they're aware. You know, I, I think the education, the background of this is important because people create their own narratives around what this what this ultimately means, and and just being able to be upfront and, and clear about what the financial and fiscal picture of the county looks like at the moment is. I think in our best interest as a school district. Just for context, so, and I guess looking at where we are now with the inflationary pressures and the cost overruns and the labor cost increases that we're seeing, um, what is $90 million in our CIP? I mean, what does $90 million in our CIP actually buy us? So, so $90 million in our CIP is, is you know, a middle school plus, um, you know, major infrastructure work at, at other schools. I mean, that's really what that accounts to these days. So it's not, uh, it's, it's not a small ask. Um, you know, we've, uh, I, I think as we explained the first and through our work session, we've looked at every one of our projects already because of inflationary pressures, because of, of other um, cost implications, and, and gone through value engineering exercises, shrunk these schools as much as we possibly can. Um, you know, so going back to individual schools and just shrinking them and cutting them, uh, we, we've already done that. So I, I think, unfortunately, we're at the point now it's, 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 it's really just continuing to look at it from a delay standpoint and, and what those implications are. And, and I would just mention, though, the, the delays are not easy, right? I mean, I think a lot of people say, well, it's, what's one year, what's two years? But as our pressures grow at these schools from a capacity standpoint, you're talking about 700, 800 kids over capacity at some of the schools. Um, not just one or two, multiple schools at the high school level, and and that uh, those those implications of of having that sort of space deficits are are real, and and we're trying to obviously be very upfront about what those challenges would be, um, you know, to to those that are involved in making the final decisions around our budget. Well, it's real dollars too, right? And um, you know, the capacity pressures on schools. When schools infrastructure is overburdened, then, that, then your maintenance costs are going up, right. and and all of that. So, you deterioration factor increases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. So it's um, okay. And so, just you know, big picture. So for the vast listening audience, and I know we're already starting to hear from communities with concerns mm -hmm. about what the additional de de decrease in the county CIP is going to mean for the projects that we have on our CIP plan. Um, just looking at, you know, several years ago we moved to a new way of prioritizing. You're looking at all schools through the same set of indicators and, and not just at one point in time, but committing to reviewing each school through the lens of those key facility indicators on an on an ongoing basis, so that we 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 get away from the sacred the old sacred queue. Um, so, I mean, just in that context, to the commitments we've made to continuously assess the condition of our facilities and make decisions based on what that continuous review tells us. What I mean, what is the big picture for communities right now? Looking who have who have projects in our CIP that we are you know, when we are faced with the 90 million, potential $90 million impact? And, and, and that is a great question. Actually, we, we had the opportunity, um, you know, Ms. Rivera Oven was, was at uh, Damascus High School the other night, and we heard from, from students around this idea that um, if you're on, you know, this proposed list from a schedule that you just stop all work, right? You know, this idea that, you know, if an elevator breaks, that you're just going to 
wait until you get to the project to fix the elevator or replace it. And, and obviously we made the commitment that that's not what we do. We, we obviously look at, at every project and we, we replace, we, we repair everything that needs to be repaired um, in order to, to maintain a functioning school. Um, but at the same time, you know, there are major investments that need to be made in, in many of these schools. Um, you know, it could be the roof, it could be HVAC systems. And one important element to those major projects is that, you know, we typically rely on state funding to help us with those projects. Um, so for example, if we were to, you know, to do an HVAC project at Damascus High School, um, you know, the state would ultimately approve that. But when we go to ask for funding for the for a portion of the replacement or or addition, they deduct that from from our eligibility and our overall funding. So it, it almost starts to put us in a bit of more of a state funding matching hole as, as we go through. So we're we try to be very strategic about what investments we make over time um, to ensure that uh, you know that that we 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 do what we need to do to maintain and keep these buildings operational, but we also look at it from a fiscal standpoint to maximize every dollar we can, both from the local and the state perspective. Yeah. Uh, do you, are there a lot of projects that, I mean, we talked about this at the full board um, during the CIP amendments in terms of, you know, my concern about, you know, what people refer to as band-aiding um, situations and, um, you know, I, but I do happen to sometimes agree that with the change from the Q to the key facilities indicators that sometimes we put in a little bit of money, which then all of a sudden changes the level for the key facilities, and then all of a sudden that project falls down again and again and again and again. Um, are you looking at things like that that maybe could wait until a bigger project is possible to contribute towards the funding? Yes, and, and we and that's a good question. We've we've heard that over over time. I, I, I before I get into those specifics, I, I do want to just put out there in terms of of the big picture, right? So what we do know, and the reason we went to the key facility indicators, and the reason we have not created this long list, is that we do know schools uh, degrade differently over time, and and it's not fair, you know, to a school to say, all right, you know, I will we will do this project in 20, 2035. And between now and 2035, a lot can change. And, and so for us, it was really important to be able to come back periodically and make sure we have the most up-to-date information to make the best decision at the time that, that we're making decisions. So that's, that really is the idea of getting away from that long list. Um, that long list just, just creates of that anxiety <laughs> and, and, and frustration. And, and it really is just terrible. making decisions with the information that you have in front of you. In terms of, of thinking about it in terms of like w if projects need to happen at certain schools and they're sort of on the cusp of do we wait to do a major capital project or do we do an HVAC project? You know, so what we're doing now is to try to try to blend it all together. And and what I would say is there are projects, and I'll give you a perfect example, Damascus Elementary. You know, that project was one that was and, and started to say with the Damascus theme, but we, we were up there and this is fresh in my mind from those conversations. But um, about uh, about eight years ago, maybe six years ago, um, they were due for an HVAC replacement. And we had the decision of saying, okay, do we install the 30-year system or do we install something that's a little more fiscally effective, but, but the lifespan is probably closer to 15 years? We, we chose the more fiscally responsible 15-year plan, knowing that when we get to a point, knowing that this building needs needs more than just an HVAC system, it needs you know major infrastructure around ADA. has it has program issues. It has a lot of um, you know pedestrian access challenges. Let's make a fiscal decision to give them the 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 requirements they need around indoor air quality, comfort conditions, but do it in a way that's fiscally responsible that when we get to the point of when we need to replace it, it, it makes sense and it's still within our, our key facility indicators, it's still within the infrastructure guidelines of what we're trying to do. But on the flip side, there are cases where you may have a school, and, and again, this is not age-based, right? So a lot of people, a lot of folks think, okay, if my school was built in such and such a time, it means it's next on the list. That's not, that's not true. We're looking at it purely from all the infrastructure. You know, the HVAC, the electrical, the plumbing, you know, stormwater, the roofing systems, all of it together. If there's a school that is, 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 has sufficient infrastructure but needs an HVAC system, needs a new roof, we can do an HVAC system and a roof 
and, and it becomes within our, the adequacy standards that we have as part of the KFIs. So, so I, I, I don't want to get to a point where people are saying, don't do an HVAC project here <laughs> because I, I, I want a major capital project. But we, we also have to realize the fiscal uh, implications of where we're at. The state is really pushing us to maintain and stretch um, you know, our systems well beyond the expected life, uh, you know, life cycles of, of them. And it makes sense. You know, we, we have been, and I would say the last, you know, 20 years in this wait to replace mode, and we're transitioning more now into preventative maintenance, strategic replacement, strategic infrastructure improvements, and then if it makes fiscal sense, doing major teardowns and replacements where, where again, that makes the most sense fiscally and from a programmatic standpoint. So, so it is a balance, and, and yes, you're going to have folks that are frustrated in terms of my building's old. You know, but if we made strategic in investments that have made that building sufficient and to meet the demands of today's academic needs, then then it's an old building, but it's a great building and it meets the academic you know requirements of our students. So, just one quick question, other quick question. Um, I didn't see the um, CIP discussion at the council. So were there other agencies that are being affected by these reductions as well? Is this an across the county type of issue? Yes, I, I believe the, uh, the largest, uh, I mean, I think we're the largest uh, dollar figure of the not the second round of non recommended reductions, but the college was also impacted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, parks, uh, recreation. You know, it was it was across the board. But since we do have a larger share, it, it does seem to be. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you to Mr. Adams for going the other night to the community meeting. But it just gives us a glimpse of how sometimes uh, communities really don't understand the process of what the CIP reduction is and and even you know there was comments well why can't you just move from the operating budget to the CIP and so because you know you, we're not you know when you're a community member you, you know things don't make sense and, and certainly the CIP sometimes doesn't make sense right why why is happening so I think it's so important to to communicate that we really at the mercy of the executive and the council when it comes to the cuts and where we're making those cuts and I think a lot of light bulbs went on at Damascus High School that a lot of the advocacy needs to go um, to these meetings on the 11th and 13th when they have public comments for them to take their narrative and their story of how they already been put on the waiting list ones and that what that means now and and then the Damascus Elementary uh, example is a per perfect example because when I was on the Board of Elections, we had such a hard time with the ADA compliance to use that building. So it's not easy to evaluate a lot of, a lot of the needs, but it's also important for the community to understand the process, and sometimes that is not very well conveyed. So I want to thank you for, for facing <laughs> the music with me that night um, and you did an excellent job and I told him I will take him to every community right? meeting with me. Yay! <laughs> it does the smile, I have to say. People are mean. <laughs> and speaking of, so as we're winding this down, if you could give us, we've been hearing about, <laughs> it's true, he does take a beating with a smile. Um, <laughs> Um, like came out wrong. <laughs> yeah, but it's true um, um, that we've been hearing some concerns, mainly health related, around the Poolsville uh, High School ongoing construction project, particularly related to the the uh, tarring chemicals used on the roof. Um, so, if you could just give us an update as to how we're working with contractors um, to modify uh, construction practices and address the community concerns. Sure. Yep. So, so Poolsville obviously has has uh, you know many of the, the the parents and students have reached out around the concerns around the the tarring process related to the roofing there. Um, I I would just say just starting out you know this this process is is no different than any of the other schools that we do right. So it is it is something I, I don't want I don't want anybody to think that we're doing something unique at Poolsville that does not happen anywhere else. This is a process that happens at every one of our schools, additions, uh, new builds. Um, what we're finding, though, however, at Poolsville is that you know we, we are looking at that existing building 
um, to better understand. It's called sort of infiltration, meaning air that can come into the building. Again, that's one of the reasons we're rebuilding it is because the infrastructure is not there to, to keep a, a, a tight building from an energy efficiency standpoint, from an air quality perspective. So as we're going through this process, we are finding that some of those, those smells are, are making their way into the school. Uh, that is not typically the case on many of our other projects. So there's a series of mitigation measures that we've put in place. Um, we have we have put in obviously you know different provisions that would create negative air pressures. We we have we have pushed our 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 tarring operations to towards the end of the day, the evenings. Um, there's a lot of things that we've done differently on this particular project that I think have helped. Um, but, it, but at the same time, there, there has been a, a, um, a performance that has been, you know, being practiced for that I believe it's happening this weekend. I'm going to uh, that was, that's, the, the work is directly around the auditorium. The performance is in the auditorium. The practices after hours are in the auditorium. And there's been concerns just around, you know, what has happened and, and the impacts to that performance. So we have put in a lot of mitigation measures. One of the things that we have decided to do is to, to halt operations until after the performance, dive right back in, you know, following and over spring break. And we only have about a week's worth of work left around the auditorium. And then we transition to a different part of the site, a higher part of the site which I do believe is going to change the dynamic of that particular school dramatically. Um, but, but what we have heard you know, from, from a lot of students and parents is, you know, are you creating an unsafe condition? Um, we, we, we have procured the services of industrial hygienists. We, we are testing uh, you know, conditions. We're going to continue to test conditions during our operations. Uh, if there are any levels, and we're not waiting to see if they, they get to a point where they're at the, um, the risk level, if they start to rise, we're going to shut down operations and, and revisit and look at different ways. But I think from a variety of different building approaches, um, to negative pressure approaches, to operational approaches, and, and others, I, I do think we're, we're going to turn the corner on the challenges at Poolsville and, and, and be able to be in a place where we're minimizing our disruptions due to construction here in the very, very near future. So I, I know, um, again, there's a lot of concerns with the indoor air quality, but, but uh, you know, we've, we've also met with the health and wellness. I went out and met with the, uh, the, the parents of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the drama team that are part of this performance. We talked about it. We, we came up with, with some compromise solutions, and, and I do think we're, we're in a really good place. We actually just received a, a, a really, you don't get the, the good emails very often, but we, we saw a really fantastic email saying thank you for going above and beyond to figure out how to, to improve conditions for, for the students at Poolsville. And, and I think even if you just get one of those, it makes you, f you feel like you are doing the right thing and you're, you're, you're headed down the right track. So I do think we've turned the corner on Poolsville, and I do think it's a safe space, it's a safe condition. And, and we also committed to work with individuals in that school. So even if there's one student uh, that, that, that uh, reacts differently to smells or sounds, we're committed to working with individuals as well as the whole to make sure we, we improve those, those conditions. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. They're going to continue to work through spring break and everything, right? Yes. I, I just wanted to make sure I understood you were saying after spring break, it'll likely be at a different point. Yep. So, so the performance is this weekend. Yep. Um, following this weekend, we're gonna we're gonna start and obviously work through spring break and then cha transition onto the site from our roofing operations. So, I I believe once we really come back from spring break with the students, it's gonna be a very different experience um, that they're 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 seeing. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, and I think it's really important for people to understand. Um, the, the way that the, the system has engaged on these issues. I know Mr. Fitzpatrick has been um, kind of immersed in some of these issues as well and uh, addressing the concerns of the community. So I really appreciate the fact that um, we're listening and we're, we're putting in place reasonable mitigation measures. And, you know, we've been talking about delaying projects, and I don't think um, we're, he despite what we've heard from a very few in the Polesville community, I do not think the greater community wants us to delay that project. Mm -hmm. I think they want that project to finish. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I very much appreciate the work you're doing to address concerns, but keep the work moving forward. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else on CIP? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so the next item on the agenda um, is uh, item seven, operational excellence standing items and sustainability. First thing, we are talking about our staffing allocations, um, something that we've, is, this is the season, and we clearly, I know you, I'm sure all of us are starting to hear from students, staff, and family around the initial and again, let's emphasize the initial <laughs> staffing allocation recommendations that have gone out to schools. Um, and so we committed, along with, uh, with the, in conversations with Mr. Riley, to just having a conversation around the process to help um, our vast listening audience understand how that process of, uh, of allocating staff to our 211 schools with all of their different uh, needs, populations, programs, um, works. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach by any stretch. So I will let our staff members uh, introduce themselves. Good morning, Vicki Parkan, Acting Director for Delmay, the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education. Good morning, my name is Tamara Hewlett. I am the Elementary English Language Development Supervisor. All right. So uh, again, uh, Vicki Parkan, and uh, this morning what we want to do is just to provide some information regarding our English language development ELD um, staffing process for this upcoming school year. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to begin with just a little bit of a background. Um, we can see here our uh, ELD English language development enrollment trends um, for the past five years. Um, as you know, um, our EMLs are the fastest growing service group in MCPS. And with the exception of the FY 2021 school year, um, which was in the midst of the pandemic, we have been growing by an average of almost 1,000 new EMLs uh, per year. While our elementary stu uh, students comprise the majority, over 50% of our EML population, most of the yearly growth is happening at the secondary level, both middle and high school. If we can go to the next slide. So just for um, the uninitiated <laughs> or in our land of acronyms, EML is Emerging Multilingual Learners. It used to be called ESOL. It used to be ESOL. called uh, ESOL. So we refer to our students, yes, thank you, I thought I had uh, read it out, but EMLs, Emergent Multilingual Learners, our students, and ELD is the other acronym we use for our program, so English Language Development. Um, on this slide, you can see our enrollment trend for the current year, and it, it, it only goes through March 1st. Typically, we take June to June. Um, between June of 2022 and this uh, year, March 1st, we have seen an increase of enrollment of over um, 1,200 new emergent multilingual learners, EMLs. Um, again, the, the bulk of them at the secondary level. Um, our ELD enrollment data is reported to MSDE, and every year um, we submit a report in November to the state. Um, includes uh, those students whose parents have submitted a parent refusal. And um, so if you count those students, um, they're not receiving services, but they do count in our enrollment numbers, and they are assessed yearly um, for EL, uh, for the, the access for ELLs um, assessment that they would have taken actually just now. Um, we do not staff for parent refusal, so if schools have submitted those forms, um, we, we're aware that the students originally tested into the program, but there is no staffing provided for parent refusals. And if you were to include the parent refusals, that's where we get that, that number, the over 31,000 EMLs that we currently have, um, again, as of March 1st. Next slide. 
Um, so some of the things that you're going to notice in our staffing um, is how we differentiate. So for elementary schools, um, the EMLs, we um, consider their proficiency level first and foremost. So um, we have ELPs. Um, anywhere from level one, a beginning student, to a level four. Um, then we look at the schools, again, elementary schools. Is it a Title I school? Is it a focus school? And thirdly, it doesn't fit either of those three categories. So we have um, different differentiated staffing for those three. For middle schools, um, we differentiate for our METs. Um, those are our students with limited or interrupted formal education, so our SLIF students, um, and then the non-METs. So there's two categories, and the same would apply to high schools. You're either a METs, SLIF student, or a non-METs. Um, so that's the differentiation that happens at those levels. If we can go to the next slide. And so I'm going to explain, <laughs> orient you to uh, what you see on the screen. Um, there are going to be some commonalities no matter the level uh, that we're working with. So um, the first commonality I'm going to uh, orient you to the bottom of the screen is what we call minimally compliant ELD program. Um, across all of the levels, we say if you have one EML to a certain range, you minimally have this much FTE staffing. So at the elementary level, at a minimum, you will have a 0.4 FTE, which if, if you have one to 20 students. Um, there are a lot of accountability measures that ELD teachers have to do. Um, and what we found in the past was just staffing for proficiency levels did not uh, sufficiently provide uh, the ELD teachers to be able to do all the other um, federally mandated paperwork that we had to do um, throughout the year. And so at a minimum, if you have one to 20 students, you have a 0.4 FTE. Then we apply the top part of what you see on the screen. Uh, again, um, depending on the school type, Title I focus, non-Title I or non-focus, your FTE calculation differs. What you will find is you get more staffing for the lower proficiency levels. So if you look at the ELP1 uh, row, you will see that for about eight students, you'll get a 0.2 FTE. Um, that equates to a one day. So if you do the points across a week, 1.0 gives you a full week uh, all day teacher. Um, and so that's how the formula kind of, kind of uh, breaks down. For, so ELP level one um, in a uh, Title I school, uh, it's less students for the same amount of staffing. So uh, uh, seven students instead of eight. Um, so Title I in focus, ELP1 will get, uh, the formula will be applied for seven students for um, a 0.2 FTE for seven students. <laughs> How's that even equal to a person? Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I just stop you there? Because, sure. Okay, because, because the public's watching and, and, yes. and, and this is very new to me how you do, but can you just give me like an example, like use a school, like my district, for example, Daily Elementary is a farm school. Like explain to me with that example, and then you can do another example with a non-farm school, and that way it would make so much more sense to me. Okay, so let's say daily elementary, Title I, yes. they receive Title I services. So we would look at the middle column okay. on that chart. Our students are in various ranges. So if you are at a 0.4 ELP proficiency, you are close to meeting the state level of being English proficient, college and career ready um, student. So that's at a 0.4, uh, ELP proficiency level, it takes a 4.5 to exit receiving ELD services. So students at a ELP proficiency level of 
point of uh, uh, four will receive less staffing um, in the formula as we calculate it. In a, in a level one. Than a level one. But remember, daily has all of those levels across every grade level. Okay. So I don't have daily's exact numbers here, but daily probably has close to 200 yes. plus EMLs. Yes. And so within that range, when we calculate the staffing, because we know what their proficiency levels are, either from the WIDA screener assessment, if they're new, all we have is a WIDA screener assessment, but we use the WIDA access for L's assessment to determine the proficiency levels for most of the students. And so we use that ELP level and we apply the formula. You take all the, the ELP ones and you say, these students need more intensive staffing. So let's say they have 50 EML uh, level ones. We would apply uh, the, for every seven students, they get a, a 0.2 FTE. So you do that calculation. So you kind of group the students by their proficiency levels. ELP one, ELP two, ELP three, ELP four. And then that tells you how many FTEs, ELD teachers, your school is going to receive. So, just if I didn't <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. There will be not, because I'm... And I can pull it up. Uh, if there's 50, I, I was taking your 200. Yes. Mm -hmm. us, going on the assumption there's 50 in each group. Yes. So, for the 50 students that are at the level one, they would receive one and a half teachers? Yes. So one full-time, one part-time? Mm -hmm. If you did the math right. If I did the math right? <laughs> yes. Roughly? Yes. I was think <laughs> sorry, I was thinking uh, you, you would divide the 50 by 7. That's what right? I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then times, times by point And then yes. times time by point yes. 0.2. Yes. So yes. you get that for the ELP 1s. You would do the same now for the ELP 2s, which is still 7. The ELP 3s is still 7. So same thing, yeah, but right? Correct. Yes. The last one, the ELP 4s, is 8 for a Title I school. Mm -hmm. That's where it... So for 200 kids, there's roughly five teachers. One and a half per, yeah, three, six, yeah. almost six, yeah, six because right? Why, if you up the eight, I was just going on the, yeah. I'm rounding down. But, okay. <laughs> yeah. And Five or six teachers to teach 200 kids is what you're telling me. Yes. About, and it, again, it really heavily relies on the English language proficiency level. So you might have a school of 200 that has higher ELP uh, proficiencies of threes and fours and lower, so the number would change. But that's the genu genu general formula for it. Okay. I was, like I said, going based on 200 students yes. to see at each level. Yes. Yeah. And that equates to roughly five or six teachers. Yeah. Seems like a lot. But, okay. but when are we... A lot of students. So it's, it's you know, these allocations, are, the in initial first round is happening in February, which is a long way away from the end of August when the school year is going to kick off for 23-24. Mm -hmm. So at at what point in time are you assessing the students in a school to start looking at staffing allocations for the coming school year? And when, at what point in time have you, has their English, English language proficiency, proficiency mm -hmm. been assessed mm -hmm. since that is also key to your staffing allocation? Mm -hmm. Great question. We continuously look at this, um, at staffing, uh, but we have strategic points in which we have to do that. So our students just finished taking the 2022-2023 WIDA Access for L's assessment. We get the scores in May. We have to get the scores, figure out who moved, what their new proficiency level is, which ones exited, and uh, the system uh, enters that information and then at the beginning of July, they flip the data. So we know who's coming back. So we, 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 we from June to, to July, beginning of July, we're working through the exits, the, the um, returners, the new incoming students, et cetera. In July, we do another round of staffing to ensure um, that schools are staffed uh, adequately, depending on how, much F, how many FTEs we have in reserve. So July comes, but we also know that 
in the, the international office is getting a lot of students from July, August, September. Um, so we try to make sure we are conservative in the additional staffing, knowing we're getting more students and knowing that our, for the most part, our kindergartners who have not been screened yet will qualify for services. So the kindergartners haven't been screened, but we did staff for kindergarten based on historical trends. But they might have a, you know, a few more that we need to give, give to. So we have to wait for the access assessment data to come in, which comes in in mid-May. Schools will get it electronically mid-May, paper reports at the end of May. The system has to clean up the data that data is not official from WIDA until August. Um, so there's lots of moving parts, right? Um, but we do do a round in, in July, and then we do another round in October, November, once enrollment has settled. So we have to wait for enrollment data to settle, be submitted to the state, and we do another round. In the meantime, we are communicating with schools. There's a process with our um, OSSWB team where administrators uh, report, well, we're seeing higher numbers, and we're checking the enrollment all the time, um, but we're seeing higher numbers, uh, and then we meet together with the OSSWB team um, in late October, early November to do any additional rounds that we need to do. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a rolling process, but there are certain things that have to happen, data that we have to have, um, that we, we have to, to have it in order to act on it. Can I just uh, ask a quick clarifying question? Yes. The W whatever over <laughs> so you said, is yes. that the school support improvement? Yes. Office of School ISSI. Support and Well-Being. And I would just add that really what you hear is like this moving target, yes. right? Yes. And um, I mean, we try to keep up with it monthly, looking at the numbers, working closely with the um, International Admissions Office to hear from them. Like we tend to get an influx of students in January mm -hmm. has been very common. Mm -hmm. And so we hold on to a little bit of staffing because we want to be prepared for, you know, these increases. It makes one of the challenges we have is if you have a decrease, and that's been something we've been trying to work through this year, where it's really hard to go back to a school and say, okay, now give us back, right? right? Mm -hmm. Once it's been in the started. middle of the year, yeah. that's that's a, a challenge. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, we know that we have this continuous enrollment. And so we went back in November and added what we could. We had a number of requests from schools. Some schools are very creative in making their staffing work, but we know that that's not necessarily in the best interest of the students they're serving. Um, and then we went back January, February, I think was the last time we met with um, OSSWB to talk about again some of the changes that, that needed to happen. But it's mm. truly a moving target for us. I'm getting anxiety just listening <laughs> to this process <laughs> because it seems very overwhelming for you guys and for the schools. And I'm wondering, you're such an expert on this field, right, Ms. Barkin? I, I just want you to be so honest. Does this process with this timeline is this the best we can do? Because it seems to me, as somebody who has taken so many kids, you know, for enrollment and, and it's only one place, you know, you have to go to Rocking Horse. So like I have kids in Damascus that they could not do the public transportation. You have to take six buses to get to Rocking Horse. So, but I'm just wondering, this timeline to me seems a little bit off in order to be do what's in the best interest of the schools, the kids, and you guys. So. The Office of School Support. 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 <laughs> I need to learn these acronyms <laughs> so bad. <laughs> I need to learn these acronyms. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the public doesn't know the acronyms either, so that's good. But I'm just, you know, because maybe for them, right, and nothing, you know, I'm sure we, but maybe for them this works. But like you said, this is this is a vex, very moving target, mm -hmm. and we know that there's certain times in the year 
that we get this influx, right, of, of young people and mm -hmm. children coming into the system, it just doesn't seem that there's this well coordinate, coordination happening. And I'm just wondering where the where the missing piece is and how we can make that work better. So I think, you're the expert. Right. And I just want to hear from you and you tell I don't us. know about being the expert, but, but, but you're, I will you're tell awesome. you that I think the, the timing of the WIDA access, which just finished now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We don't get those results until May, mm -hmm. yet we've already sent out the staffing. Right. I think you know, in my mind, especially in secondary school, it really impacts how students are scheduled because the timing, again, does not align with the articulation process that usually begins in December at middle and high schools. And so it, it's, it's not ideal, but it's really out of our hands, you know, what we have, so, teachers. So whose hands is it on? That's what I'm trying to get to. Who, whose hands do we have to, like, talk I to? I would say the, the state. The uh, we did <laughs> testing the times or right? whatever. I mean, yeah, Give they could do it earlier, but the problem with doing it earlier is you know, that we're not getting uh, the real the time real data of data. where kids are at in terms of their performance. Oh, so it, you know... January is currently when the testing is happening. I don't know, I guess maybe a question would be why does it take three, four months for us to get the, but that's, that's across the board with a lot of the assessments that, you know, that are state mandated the, the time. Because we're not the only ones in this. And no. procurement, right? It's right. every, you know, it's Prince George's County, it's every Baltimore school City, district, it's every school district. I so I'm just wondering where the advocates can be to to get those results. Like, it doesn't make sense. Why does it take four months? Is yeah. it they do it by hand, maybe? Well, I mean, so the window just finished in March. So it started in January, and it wraps up in March, and then you package and send, and we get it back in May. So um, I do know that there has been advocacy from the state to shift the window some, but we are con competing with other states and their windows. Um, so so that's, one that's one mandate that is, uh, provides a challenge, but the other um, is the enrollment file that is, is sent. Um, we, we have to give students enough time to get into the, the district, be screened, and enrollment uh, be sent to the state in order for us to get our official count. So there's those, those certain windows really um, set us up to the timeline that we do have. But we are responsive. Yeah around those those timelines um, just to make sure that we're not waiting. Um, once we get the official en enrollment count, it doesn't mean our students stop coming, <laughs> right? So we, um, we meet and we give out more staffing as, as best as possible. Um, but using historical data, we're pretty close. You know, we look at where our student counts are per school. Um, by the end of June, and we say, okay, well, this is a this is like the, their peak. So let's try to staff for that when we do the the January February staffing. And I would just say, you know, there's a lot of things like this. Um, you know, we talk. Uh, one of the recent board meetings about the students who enter our schools, you know, after August and after September that we don't get the funding for. And so, you know, a lot of this stuff that is state mandated doesn't align as well as we would like it to. But I think what you're hearing from the team here today is that, you know, we really do everything, including looking at historical trends, you know, uh, allocating resources uh, as soon as we can, but then also going back and looking at, you know, what has changed between now and the beginning of the school year and then even after the school year begins uh, to really address those challenges and meet the needs of the students as best we can given you know the timeline challenges that we face so just a couple quick observations looking at the clock um, so based on the numbers that we have here what we're seeing is that um, our emergent multilingual learners at what at whatever level they're at comprise basically one in five of our students here in Montgomery County Public Schools and so my question one is um, we talk about we're talking about staffing allocations but what is the landscape for having qualified 
EML, ELD teachers. So, you know, we, we can staff for what we need, but do we have the staff with those qualifications to fill those slots? I think that has been a challenge for our district for, for a while now. I know as a principal, uh, we struggled to get ELD certified because um, a lot of teachers now are getting taking the praxis and getting their ELD certification that way, but without necessarily all of the background in terms of educational courses. Um, to really be able to meet the needs of our students. Um, so it, it's definitely a challenge. Then you add to that the fact that we're now looking for bilingual teachers for our TWI programs um, at the elementary school. I mean, ELD teachers, you know, don't need any language other than English. It's a plus if they have something, but it, it's not a requirement. Um, but it, it's a challenge now, and I think, as you said, 20% of our students um, are, are in our ELD program receiving Why our ELD future services. workforce is in our classrooms right now. Yep. Because they are multilingual. Correct. You know, yeah. not going to be an issue. And if I may just add, I think um, the initiatives that are happening at the state level will help with that. So there are, with the Maryland Blueprint uh, EL work group that happened at the state level, um, they're truly bringing light to teacher certification um, and, and ensuring that the workforce uh, is created um, and, and, and there's some, some um, certification opportunities that are happening. So I think that, that will help. And um, as a system, we also are ensuring that our ELD teachers are getting professional learning. So whichever way you enter and you become ELD certified, um, I know that we have cohorts for first and second year so that we at least ensure that they know the tools, they know the framework, they know what it means to um, uh, grow in, uh, a student's English language development. So, you know, as much as we can um, support uh, with, with what's in our locus of control, we are doing that on this side as well. And I would just observe as well, I mean, we know that this is a population of students that we have not served particularly well historically. Mm -hmm. And so it's two things, right? It's the staffing, but it's also what, how we are instructing those students in the classroom. And I think we know that the second piece, if you want to call it pedagogy or whatever you want to call it, we know we, we as a school system need a sea change in the way we are teaching those students in the classroom. Because and what we've been doing, not, not working. working. You heard it when we presented from the Cal report. Yes, we have to get all of our teachers. It, this cannot be the responsibility of the ELD you know, teachers that are at the school. The, the students are going to multiple classes throughout the day, so all of our teachers uh, at the school level need that, that professional learning, and we are working on that as well. But that's a huge challenge. Okay, off to the last thing. Yes. Okay, so that's the formula. <laughs> and what, what you see on the screen right now is just elementary. So um, if we can just go to the next slide so you can just see what it looks like for middle school. Um, I just want to point out the minimally compliant number changes from 20 to 35. Uh, when we think about middle school and high school, it's courses now. We're thinking the students are taking a course versus um, they're in their elementary classroom. So the minimally compliant number changed to a 35. And then you can see that the non-METS formula uh, changes again by the ELP proficiency level uh, and the FTE changes. And then there is just like a standard staffing. If you have a METS program in your uh, school, you're staffed with less than five students, a 0.4, 5 to 14 uh, SLIFE, it's a 1, et cetera, et cetera. So we now have um, Title I Middle, middle school. school. So is there? Yes. It's not differentiated because of because of the course model. Okay. Okay. All right. But I know I've I've brought that up, mm -hmm. and it may be something. I mean, now that we have four Title One schools, I think it's something we need to consider. And you see, um, you know, the numbers are growing here. So this this is part of the challenge as well. And if we can go to the next slide, we would see the formula for high school. 
And so again, the lower the proficiency level, the more staffing you receive. Um, the number of students per course and the supports for FTEs uh, increases as the English language proficiency level increases. Okay. Any additional questions from my colleagues? Hard work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. And next um, is the same conversation. We're going to look at our um, staffing allocations for our special education students. Um, which is, again, we know uh, have a tremendous need, as does every other school system in the country, for special educators. Good morning. I think we have a PowerPoint as well. Good morning. My name is Julie Hall. I'm the director for the Division of Business, Fiscal, and Information Systems in the Office of Special Education. And I just want to thank you for this opportunity to share this information with you. Um, part of our process that we follow is a plan, do, study, act method methodology. If you want to go to the next slide. And so we have to begin with the planning phase, which is our budget development, because that is where we start with everything, and that allocation is just the actualization of that plan. So we key principles that we focus on are consistency, transparency, differentiation, and flexibility. Uh, we are consistent across um, similar schools, receive the same resources. Uh, stakeholders know how and why these decisions are made. Allocations are differentiated. Um, Schools with greater needs or different programs receive different resources. And then we have to be flexible. As you asked in the previous conversation with their staffing, students arrive for special ed all year long. So there isn't a set time students can be identified, students can have an IEP meeting, services change, placements change, so things change all year. And then we have a lot of students that move in for our, our programs. Next slide, please. Um, you talked about impacts on the budget, and specifically with special education, we have maintenance of effort. In addition to the system-wide maintenance of effort, special ed has maintenance of effort that we have to maintain every year. Uh, blueprint funding uh, also increases some of the funding that we have, and we've seen that in previous board presentations with PEP and pre-K. So that is something that has that push and pull effect on our resources. A big one for us is enrollment changes, and you're going to see that in the next couple of slides. Uh, next slide, please. This gives you a month-to-month -month kind of process map in terms of our planning stages for budget development. We start, so this June, we're going to be starting our plan for fiscal year 2025's budget. And, and you say, well, that's really early, but there's a lot of information that we collect along the way that drives our decisions. We look at a macro level, which is all of our enrollment and all the services, and then we break it down to the uh, next level down where we look at programs across elementary, middle, and high school, and then we look at it at the individual school level because there's so many factors that could impact staffing at a single school. Then we, then we um, share that information with our partners in OSWB, and we also um, work with them closely to see you know what kind of changes or tweaks things that we wouldn't know from just looking at the numbers but like boots on the ground um, we also meet with our partners and facilities because this is also a big challenge because as we have programs that are expanding or moving to different areas of, of the school system facilities is always a challenge in terms of how to um, effectively program for all our students in september we submit our budget next slide um, so this is the macro level data, and you can see that um, we look at, at comparisons between our gen ed student count and our special ed student count. If you look at gen ed from 2016 to 2024, there is a difference of about 6,000 students. Special ed, there is a difference in the same time frame, about 4,000 students. But what's striking to me is the percent increase is 3.8% increase in, in our general ed students, but with special ed students is 21.9% increase. So we continue to have a percent even increase just even through COVID and closures where we saw significant decreases on the gen ed side. Our population still continued to rise. 
Next slide. This is that one level down, that data dive I was talking about. This one specifically focuses on autism. Um, it's always on the top of my mind because we have significant growth from 2018, and these are average actuals um, that we collect monthly and then roll it up for the year. From 2018 to our projection for 24, it's doubled in the last six years in our population. Next slide is the, an example of that di deeper dive where we look at a single school. So I called it Sugar Loaf School because didn't want to highlight one particular. Um, and so you can see we do that average actual enrollment by program at that level of um, program level. And then we take that data from supervisors. You know, what is the composition of the class? Is it a K-2 class? Is it a K-5 class? Do we have, you know, more medically fragile kids in this class? Does that dictate a possibility for more staffing or critical staffing? And so that's put into these notes and, and put together in our collaborative meetings. Next slide, you'll see that we take this level of data. Next slide. And we roll it up to our budget, this should look familiar to you. This was our 2024 uh, chapter one support to schools budget. So all that data that we did drove that uh, final number. This is chapter one and the next slide will show, should be familiar. Oops, I guess we got rid of chapter five. Chapter five also has a budget for special education and it has a lot of central office positions that directly support schools. So we have our related service providers that are managed centrally and that provides that um, an opportunity to be flexible and be able to direct resources exactly where it needs, hopefully in a timely manner. This um, is our allocation stage of our Plan Do Study Act. So in December and January, that deep dive from macro to micro is done all over again so that we have the most recent enrollment data out of um, MOIEP, the recent services information, we go through all the same meetings and then we um, allocate in February. Then in February, we also allocate some permanent critical staffing, which is not formula driven, but it's based on specific needs and for an individual students. And, and we do, do that February through May. Then you can see on the far right, it's ongoing staffing. So we revisit our staffing um, all year long. Next slide. This just gives you a little information about the enrollment itself. It's directly from MOIEP. The projections are shared with um, our partners, our principals. They get adjusted right before they go out. Um, they're also used to drive our materials allocation and resources. Next slide. Our guidelines. Um, we. Part of the state requirement is to create a staffing plan that's published, published, published and it's on our web. And so this is one of the attachments in that guide. Um, the last time I counted, we had about 73 different formulas uh, because we, we really do look at is it an elementary, is it a pre-K, is it, is it an autism student versus a DHOH student? Or, and it, it gets really differentiated and we look really carefully at you know, matching that formula to the needs and what we think that particular program needs in the classroom. Next slide, you can see um, adjustments are made throughout the year. Adjustments are sent through our online system, which is the school allocation report. When Diane Gomez was here, I'm sure she shared that. That is something we use together. Um, and you will see any change that has an automatic response. And I mentioned that we had provide critical staffing that doesn't show up on that report. That's something that's done individually. Next slide. I wanted to give you a sense of the, the formulas because I didn't give you all 73 here. You probably wouldn't want to go through the math and for a single school, but there's different types. There's the enrollment driven model. So like our autism program, if you have six students, you get one teacher and, and 1.75 pair, a 3.44 para. So you can see how that's a huge staffing model for a small number of students. So our, that population really impacts our budget and allocation. And then there is a service-driven model per month. 
So that's an example of our infants and toddlers. So many services that they report per month, we use that trend data and then we staff based on the, the, the total number of services in the month. Next slide is another different model that we use, which is an hours driven model. And I bring this up to really focus on how things could look the same, but are very different. So these are actually four uh, elementary schools. They all have 33 special ed students. So initially you would say, well, they should all have the exact same staffing, but they don't because the staffing is driven on the hours that are on the IEP for classroom instruction. So you can see one school has 465 hours. They have more teachers, they have more parents supporting them. Another school, same identical number of students, but they only have 300 hours of service that we're, we're providing for. And so therefore their staffing is, is on this sliding scale. Next slide is the uh, outline from February to August. Some principals make trades. They'll take, based on their programming, and they'll take a teacher and trade it for the para or the para and trade it for teachers in a, that conversion model. So that occurs, that's always done with, in collaboration with our supervisors and the directors in OSWB. And that communication between us and the schools is so important in order to make that work. Um, the last part of our plan do study model, and the next slide, is our monitoring. We meet week bi-weekly to look at staffing, staffing requests. We also look at it for um, just trends that are coming up. Um, we have, like I had mentioned earlier, earlier we have a huge influx of move-ins for, for autism, which we found out you know, just recently more. And so that's gonna be something that we adjust. And those are the type of things that we talk about in those, those meetings. And the next, is final part of our process is our act or our management part of it. And so we have position management meetings. We work with HR um, and talk about some of the HR side of the staffing. We also collect anecdotal information. Um, I had an elementary principals meeting where we went over some of the same parts of this presentation so that they have information and can provide us feedback on our staffing. A big, um, Part of collecting and gaining more information to manage the process is from our special ed staffing committee, which has outside stakeholders and they help provide information that's really boots on the ground and how we might change or adjust some of our staffing allocations or models throughout the year. And the last thing is just our materials. I just wanted to reiterate that we do it based on that projected official uh, enrollment and that's what's drives our special education textbooks, media center instructional materials. One quick clarifying question. When you say outside stakeholders, are you referring to parents or students? Um, or we have parents, we have different um, special ed groups. So, uh, we have that NAACP members, um, just to get that wide range. Um, we have Down Syndrome Network that attends Quick question. So this is the staffing just for teachers, or do you guys also do staffing for the counselors? Counselors is, is not in a special education budget. Oh, okay. So this is teachers, paras, related service providers, SLPs, OTs, PTs, um, anything mm. related, related to um, any materials within the special ed, assistive technology, that's all encompassed in our budget. Okay. Counselors are in the gen ed side of the budget. I would just point out this too, you mentioned it a couple times, but um, specific student needs. So if you're at, you know, some of our special schools, students that are med medically fragile, there are nurses there on site a lot one on, with one-on-one -on -one or one-to-two care. So, um, and that comes through this process as well, mm -hmm. identifying those needs, yeah. Um, yes, very um, complicated process. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions for my colleagues? Well, I mean, thank you. So I think, you know, staffing allocations is something that are uh, continuously at issue. I don't think anybody ever thinks there's enough staffing to meet all the needs. And yet, you know, we are constantly evaluating and looking at what the, what the needs are, boots on the ground, and doing what we can. I have one, one related question. Yeah. I just, 
I, not a question, but more of a, as a follow-up type of thing. Um, I do think if we don't share this information at the full board, it might be nice to forward it on to the full board members because this is something that comes up at our full board meetings routinely. So um, it is helpful and it's yeah. appreciated. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The only question that I had for you was, what is the biggest challenge that you're having right now? Um, as you are doing the formulas mm -hmm. and you're allocating staff, like, I just would like to know, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, besides, you know, because I know it's, it's, it's hard right now. I mean, we heard, we heard with the ELD um, teachers, you know, the certification, mm -hmm. I imagine is the same for special uh, education, but I just kind of want to, if you can tell me, you know, the top two things that are right now the most challenging. The top one, I would probably reiterate, is getting, hiring enough special educators. Um, that's always been a challenge. Yeah. And we work directly with um, Office of Human Resources and going to, to fairs and getting that word out. We've, um, we've looked at different partnerships with universities to grow your own. Um, in fact, we have some of those partnerships going on right now at school with uh, speech and language pathologists. Um, so that is one of our biggest challenges. And the second one is that just that changing landscape and uh, you know students can come in at any time. And um, a former master scheduler, I know that, that it's terrible if you have to plan it all out and then you get a whole bunch of new allocations later on in the year and then you can't find the person because it's not in the typical hiring season makes it even worse and it's it's more difficult. So I think that that is probably the second biggest challenge. Yeah. Just to throw in there so that no one thinks that we're not considering them, but the hiring of paras is also a real oh, absolutely. issue and a challenge, a struggle. So absolutely. It's unfortunate, especially because then it puts that much more work on our special education teachers who are already going through a lot. So yeah. I think that makes adds to the trouble of retention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, special educators work hard. Yes, yes very, they do. Very hard. Yes, they do. Yes. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And now, moving on um, to last item on our agenda, we're moving on to highlights of school sustainability success um, and talking about also, um, if hopefully we'll have a, a few minutes to just go over some of the systemic energy and in, indoor air quality projects process that we're doing. But, and I see we have some several students here with us today. Hmm. Are they coming up now? Come on down. Come on down. Again, I feel like there should be music playing. I know. <laughs> we need a theme song. Between Something. the changing of the guards. Uh, come on over here. here. Well, we'll shift. Yeah. Absolutely. Mr. Hall doesn't mind getting a little closer to us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and thank you. As they're getting seated, I'll just call out, you know, I'm very grateful to see a lot of our, so Ms. Arate, who leads our sustainability and compliance work, but Mr. Adams in facilities is a huge supporter of our sustainability work. <laughs> Mr. Derby is heading our outdoor education. I see Mr. Benjamin from our, well, what do we, what, do we call it CERT anymore? In, in, the, in the breach, we're still calling it school energy and recycling team. But yeah, so the whole team is here. So really appreciate that. Yeah. And I will just um, turn it over to uh, you all to introduce yourselves. So my name is Lynn Sarate. I'm the director of Division of Sustainability and Compliance for MCPS in the Department of Facilities Management. And we have two principals in person, and we also have one principal who's going to join virtually. So oh, I hit this one here. Yes. yes. Never. Hello, I'm Stacy Brown, the principal at William Tyler Page Elementary School. So, good morning, Zill. So, yes, good morning. Uh, Matt Niper, the principal at Redland Middle School. Hi, my name is Emily Liu, and I'm a junior at Wooten High School. Hi, my name is Shrusti Amula. I'm a junior at Richard Montgomery, and I founded my own nonprofit to reduce food waste in our community. Uh, hello, my name is Rishi Iyer, and I'm a junior at Wooten High School. And so to recap, um, last meeting, 
of the Fiscal Management Committee, we were here and we were talking about some of the challenges for the Green School Program, and today we want to talk about some of the successes and best practices. Just to put a little context for anyone who missed the last meeting, um, the board passed a policy last year, Policy ECA, about sustainability, and some of the major work related to that policy was both MCPS as a government entity to take action, as well as local schools to be taking action. So some of the actions we're taking from a central perspective is to take a look at our schools and do building energy audits and to do everything we can to reduce both our energy consumption and our greenhouse gas consumption. We're also working on increasing our clean energy procurement. But one of the other major initiatives is our partnership with the schools for them to develop that green culture that they need to do. And the main reason um, that we, we are really pushing the Green School's participation in the Green School certification is because that Green School certification gives us that way to measure how we're doing. It shows whether or not we've achieved beginning to change that culture, whether we're sustaining that culture, because it's a built-in process that require schools to submit paperwork that provide evidence that they're doing it. So the Green School certification is really one of those kind of performance measures for the program for us moving forward. Um, in terms of the um, work that we've done with the green schools this year, schools are still in the process of submitting their applications this year. We did get that web page updated, so it's from our main sustainability web page. You can actually see the schools that have been certified. Um, once the schools finish submitting their applications for this year, the panel of statewide representatives take a look at it, and by Earth Day we will know um, how many schools actually recertified. Um, we do know that we will have probably at least 19 schools that we need to either certify or recertify to be able to make that 50% target that we have for next year. And Yes? I'm sorry, how many? 19 additional schools will have to come on board in the next year to make our 50% target for next year. Um, and but we so that's, want lots more than that. Of course. <laughs> so that's why, um, yeah, we have a total of 91 at the minute right now, but we want to get to 50% by next year. And so that's why today is happening, because we wanted to talk about best practices. We wanted to bring the principal's perspective about what the challenges are, what it takes to pursue the certification, how to get the buy-in from staff, how to um, make sure that student voice has been incorporated, and to make sure that they have support and, and that we're looking at all of the challenges and make sure that we've done that. Um, basically, this is a lot about, you know, we're thinking globally, but we're acting locally. And so that's really the perspective is that, although we all want to work on the problem of climate change, we've also got to work on it at the very local level at each individual school. And that is something that we talked about when we, when we worked on the policy and made sure that the policy talked about action at individual school levels. So with that, I will turn it over to yeah, Mrs. Right. Brown. Um, she does have to leave for another meeting at some point. So if you have any questions for her, um, shoot them now. Good morning again. Uh, little history about Page Elementary School. Uh, we've had a green team at our school since about 2005, before I even um, got there. Uh, Michelle Dean, who was a former teacher at Page, she started a green team. And multiple years, we have students, kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, they love being on uh, the green team and participating. They do things like making sure the lights are turned out, um, making sure the blinds are down, and then they also do a, a great job promoting reducing, reusing, replacing, and recycling um, at the school. They come up with videos and morning announcements. They do, you know, do lots of things like that. Um, the teachers also um, ensure that environmental science lessons are being taught um, throughout the year and it's really great that now um, we we use next generation science standards curriculum because a lot of um, those lessons provide environmental education lessons that you need um, when you are being certified as a as a, a green school um, along with lessons um, there are experiments and activities that we do and every year we have a huge Earth Day uh, celebration where we you know the kids you know talk about what they've learned um, they talk about global warming, taking care of the earth, sing songs. But this year we're doing a little change, so we'll love to invite you out. We're actually going to do school-wide project day um, where, you know, we'll incorporate projects like making bird feeders, um, putting plants in the flower gardens, um, doing experiments with pollution, how much pollution and air quality um, in the building. But um, we're really excited because in... Uh, in 2014, I'll go back a little bit, we were named, that's when we were first named a Maryland Green School. Um, then, and we were recertified in 2018 and in 2022, but in 2017, we were, we were awarded the U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon. Um, 
for the United States. So we're really excited that, you know, we also, along with being a green school, we also are a green, a national green ribbon school um, at Page. So again, we'd love to, you know, to have you out. Um, but when it comes to the certification process and the recertification process, it is a, it's a lot of documentation um, and support that we have to have from the CERT office and through Mayo, which is M A E O. I have to like look at it, look at it to really like Maryland Association. I wrote it down, yeah. <laughs> Maryland Association for Environmental and Outdoor Education Programs. We have to work kind of hand in hand um, to uh, get. Um, that support for certification and recertification. Um, for the 2022 certification process, um, our sponsor, Lauren Crook and Laura Meir, um, both on Green Team, uh, the Green Team sponsors ensured that they attended regular Green School sponsor meetings um, that they have where they can kind of keep up with deadlines, ask questions. Um, but they also, you know, we had staff, and I have to give a shout out to Jim Stuff, yes, who Yay! He has always been supportive at, at Page in helping us um, with our certification process. And I know he retired, but then he came back and he's working part time. So he, um, we just love how he always supports um, the school. And, you know, we want to ensure that we continue to have that support when he finally says, I'm done. <laughs> We want to have somebody, you know, there to to support us. Um, staff is also very important. We have a lot of buy-in at Page because, like I said, historically, we, they uh, Green Team is a part of the fabric of Page Elementary School. Um, but last year was more of a difficult year due to COVID. But luckily, be, um, because you know we were using. Um, online, you know, learning, we had a lot of slides that kind of proved here's our documentation of how we continue to have science education and environmental education even though we were online. So again, it's a lot of documentation that has to take place to be certified and um, to be uh, recertified. Um, some of the challenges when I th uh, think about it, I think for us, um, uh, in elementary school, we don't have that activity bus that the middle school and high schools have. And the activity bus is really important um, in trying to ensure we can get the, the most kids that we can coming out and being a part of um, Green Team. What we've had to do this year is we had to kind of reduce the number of students that could participate because we can't have the after school bus. So the activities have to take place during lunch and recess. And so we had to really limit it to one grade level, which is still fine. But um, like I said, we used to have K to five. So we really want to find out ways and get support in ensuring we can get um, that activity bus and, and that club. And also, we also are finding out we need, um, you know, more students stipends to help with teachers who can come forward and help be a part because you can it's very difficult to have green team with one person when you're trying to have you know lots of projects lots of ideas we get it done because there's always someone who wants to volunteer and help be on green team but um, that would definitely um, that would definitely help students are the biggest part of green team because a lot of their ideas their engagement they really make up a lot of um, the suggestions and the ideas. And one of the one that they came up with last year, because we had so many students coming back from COVID where they weren't riding the bus, the line, the uh, loop in the car loop was so long out into the street and cars were idling. So they came up with the idea and made a message about idling and pollution and, you know, made, made little commercials for the morning announcements and made signs and stood outside. So those are some of the ideas and engagement that um, our students believe in at Page and um, and who are part of the, the green team. But I really think, you know, like I have mentioned earlier, an integral part of maintaining certification is that continuous support and partnership with the CERT office um, and just ensuring that, again, their staff, they have enough staff have to come out and support the schools um, so that we can continue with being recertified each year. So that's kind of, you know, the highlights and lights of being a green school. Thank you, because I think you highlight one of the things we've been talking about is we need to make this less burdensome on schools. And that may be a bigger, broader conversation because it is MAEOE. I think that it's a certifying organization, but it shouldn't be an impediment to a school's 
getting the work they're doing being certified, just the, the, the volume of paperwork. So that's an ongoing conversation, but it's good that you're pointing that out, because I think that is something we're all focused on. Thank you. And if it's okay, I'd like to go to the middle school level next and have Mr. Nyper talk about what they're doing in middle schools. Sure, thank you. Stacy's. that was very culminating right there. <laughs> Um, and I, well, I'll say in, in terms of just one thing I want to highlight is that Redland, we are actually part of the program that's using, doing the recycling of food waste. Um, and we just started that this year, and it's actually going very well. Um, the students are buying in. Um, and I mean, it, what I'm going to say is that over the course of my career here in MCPS, this is my fourth building, third where I've been an administrator, and in all buildings I've been involved in the green school aspect. Um, I helped Northwest High School and the students get to the green ribbon status um, through the Maryland Department of Education and then going to Rocky Hill and working with their green school team and really elevating what they were doing. And now at Redland, we when I came on board, we did go through that whole original certification process to become a green school. Um, and now we are doing the recertification process this year. Um, and through all of that, really the key piece here is to have the the staff buy in and starting with the implementation prior to the school year. Um, we, in every case, we've always got a team of teachers to come together to kind of lay out an implementation plan. Um, and then how we're going to advocate for students to join the plan, both at my experience at a middle school and a high, um, sky school, high school level. Um, that's really key because, um, and then you gotta involve your building service team because the building services staff, they are the right hand to all of this um, in, the, in the whole pro process, getting kids engaged. So um, at Redland, our building services team stands that like during lunch when we're looking at recycling um, all of our food waste, when we're recycling our trays, whatever, our services team stands at the bins and helps students and guides them. And uh, two weeks in, they're doing it on their own. Um, we just stand there and kind of direct. As administration, we stand there. Our CERT team leader comes down during lunches and talks to the students about the importance of recycling. Um, the campaigns that the students do, and that's where I think Stacy was talking so much about the students piece, um, the idling campaign's amazing. You know, we've talked a lot about the campaigns about the recycling in the classrooms, the reduction of paper waste. Um, and that's all done with the students. So they do the announcements in the morning. They do the posters for the hallways. Um, Mr. Benjamin gets us the posters from the CERT team. We hang those up. It's especially exciting when one of the students at your school is recognized on that. That poster goes up, and it becomes like kind of an advocacy piece for the kids. Um, for I'm going to go with the same kind of thing. Having the ability to have stipends and for our staff um, is key. Um, you know, staff stretched thin in you know, a small middle school and even in high school. Teachers want to get engaged. They want to do after school activities. Students want to stay. Um, but it does become, you know, how often are you able to do it? The paperwork piece is a little bit difficult. Um, and that's where I kind of that summer meeting to kind of go through what are the benchmarks you need to hit as you move through the year? What do you need to take? What can you work with our CERT coordinators, Tarina Garcia? She's amazing. She comes in. She helps us with what she can help us with. And then points out like, oh, you did this. Let's take some photos. Let's get that in. Let's have your students talk right about Earth Day or Earth Hour. Let's insert that in there. Um, our science department's great at working it into the curriculum and having kids speak about the things that we're doing at the school level as part of the curriculum discussion um, and in, in our advisory piece. Um, the one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about as well and something that um, has been key for middle schools and high schools is the awards that were presented. And I think since the pandemic, we haven't really done that. Um, but it used to be like a quarterly award for energy reduction or energy savings or recycling. We had the, the paper contest, the poster contest. And then if you won a couple of them, you got the, the trifecta and your school was awarded with that. That creates a lot of school spirit around recycling, energy reduction, um, you get the, the, the students involved, you get parents engaged in it, and it really creates like a whole piece that everybody gets behind. Um, it's something I would strongly advocate for looking into, um, you know, continuing that piece, um, because I think, 
you know, as a principal, it's something that you can speak to with the community. It's something you can hang up a nice banner, but it's also something you can visually see with your recycling bins in the hallways, with your signage, with everything you're doing, and the kids feel pride in that. Um, they get excited. You know, when you say, hey, we want it all, and you put a big banner up, they're, they're proud to see that and see that their school is being recognized. Um, you know, and I just go back to um, the wonderful work that the students do, um, because without the students, this doesn't happen. Um, because staff is good about it, but the students are the ones that I see reminding staff, hey, don't forget to throw the paper in the recycling bin. Let's make sure we do that. So I think that that's key. Really quickly before we move on to the students, if I may, I just, because I, I think one of you has to leave maybe for a meeting, but um, you were mentioning about the stipends and the um, activities bus, and I just want to put a plug in there for you to reach out to the Education Foundation um, to, and ask for a grant um, for to fund those things, because this is an important um, thing you're doing, and we want to be as supportive as possible. And I just want to thank you, because, you know, Really and truly, one of the reasons we highlight this work in fiscal management is that this is gets to the operational excellence of the system. And we've made a huge commitment to sustainability with the sustainability policy. And it's, the, the goals are aggressive, but they're also essential to the, it, for, to the county. To the county to meet its climate action goals, the system, this school system, has to meet our climate action and sustainability goals. Because if we fail, the county fails. Because we are that big a piece of the fabric of the county. So creating the culture where it's not people rolling their eyes and saying, oh, it's one more thing you're asking us to do, but this energy that's like, this is amazing work that we get to do. And this is, an, we are creating an amazing school. A green school is a great school. And whatever that looks like at your school, that's a great school. And the student energy that you've mentioned, because, you know, in having conversations with people all across the country that are doing great work on the sustainability front, they, they all say the same thing. you got to have the students first. I'm like, box checked in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but it does take and that sustained change mm -hmm. in culture that just says this is the way we do business mm -hmm. in Montgomery County, not that this is, okay, we're going to, you know, get this certification and fill out this paperwork. No, it's the way we become. It's the way we evolve as our system. And you guys are doing that by shifting the culture in your school. And, you know, as we see more and more elementary schools, they take the students, because they're all passing through, right? They don't stay in elementary school forever. They move on, they move on, they move on. And then that increase, I think that is what builds the, the energy, but also the expectation that, what do you mean? You, what do you mean you don't have, you're not composting at this, what, what do you mean? What, why? And you get the students building the energy and bringing the energy as these young people will, are, are just emblematic of an amazing, just upswell of students in our county that are doing amazing things on sustainability. And a lot of them on their, you know, it's all organic. They're starting it on their own without really any support at all. So. That's, I think, the, 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 the way that you all are looking at this school as a, as an, as a microcosm, as a, its own little community. And then these students are such an engine to, to keep that going and, and blow it up with all kinds of new uh, energy and ideas. So anyway, I just thank you. Because I see the work you're doing is essential to the school system becoming the best system it can be. It's not, it's not icing on the cake. You know, it's, it is in the batter. We do have one more principal to hear from. She wasn't able to attend in person, but we do have a video from Ms. Dini from Richard Montgomery High School. Hello, my name is Alicia Dini, principal of Richard Montgomery High School. It's a pleasure to share with you some of what I've learned at RM as we've received our green school certification in the last year. The ease or difficulty of sustainability projects at a given school truly depends on the following. First, whether you have a number of staff and students who are interested in the work, and second, integrating the work into existing school structures. These projects can't depend on one or two individuals. Starting from scratch in a school can be difficult, but once you get the ball rolling, it can be self-sustaining. I'd like to share some of the key successes that I found as a principal at Richard Montgomery High School and through some of my experiences at Tacoma Park Middle School, where I was formerly principal. These are uh, successes that I have found um, that help with the components of integrating green school 
school initiatives that are sustainable and manageable. It's first very important to find staff and students who are interested in the work and then work together with them to elevate it across the school. At RM, we have both staff and students who are interested in addressing climate change, and we have clubs that are de dedicated to working on green spaces and addressing energy issues as well as waste management concerns. This has resulted in a community garden, tree planting, composting, and water conservation projects all implemented within the last year at Richard Montgomery. This has been supported by our staff, but ultimately implemented with the help of motivated students. Our school staff support the processes that students need to follow for the projects. They also help get the word out about projects to the community, and they also celebrate our students. At RM, we have an administrative secretary, building services staff, and teachers who have all been integral at our school in getting its green school certification with the support of central office staff. It's crucial to find ways to integrate these initiatives into the existing work of the school. For example, the science department staff have been instrumental in finding the places in curriculum that align to both messages and projects related to sustainability. Furthermore, it's important to get your SSL coordinator on board in so that students can complete SSL hours and support these projects as well. And finally, school leaders should celebrate and highlight the accomplishments of staff and students when they engage in these proj projects. The more you celebrate, the more the word gets out and more students and staff want to participate. One of the biggest challenges in developing projects is selecting projects that are small enough so that they continue when the students or staff who began it move on. Therefore, it's very important that these be considered when choosing projects for the school. Uh, additional stipends are also very helpful in ensuring that there are funds available for staff to continue the work. If one staff member leaves the school, that there's a fund left there, a stipend, so that a, a subsequent staff member can take it over. Um, it's also a, a great idea, if possible, for central office staff to organize opportunities for sharing of projects between schools so that ideas that are simple and easily implemented can be shared across MCPS. One of the keys to these projects being to the, one of the keys to these projects being sustainable is that they don't create extra work for the school staff. What we've seen as most successful are those projects that our high school students have been able to manage with just small support from school staff. Student voices have been at the heart of these projects. Students have brought forward proposals to the administrative team and to school staff, and then we've worked with them to help implement them. They see these as examples of their local efforts to respond to the larger global climate crisis. I'm hopeful that what I've shared is helpful to the important conversation of expanding the possibility of more and more schools becoming green school certified, and ultimately the goal of having schools that take action in response to concerns about climate change. I appreciate your taking the time to hear about our successes and challenges in achieving our green school certification at Richard Montgomery. Thank you. So next, um, go ahead, Emily. Good morning, members of the Board Fiscal Management Committee. My name is Emily Liu, and I am a junior at Wooten High School. Last month, I was able to start a composting program at my school, Wooten High School, through Compostology, which is a youth-led organization committed to diverting food waste. However, this wasn't easy by any means. The first time I proposed starting a composting program at my school was in February of 2022. However, because of the financial burden of $200 for the compost to be hauled each month, our administration decided not to go through with starting the program. However, over the summer, I found that a couple of my other peers were also astounded by the astronomical amount of food waste produced by our school and wanted to start a composting program. Thus, we persevered and once again proposed the program to our administration at the beginning of this school year. This time, we received approval and worked to apply for grants, which required which resulted in us acquiring a grant from our school's Parent Teacher Student Association. The process of starting a composting program has taught me important life skills that I will continue to build on for the rest of my life. It has taught me the value of determination, initiative, and advocacy. 
Additionally, this process has not only provided my team and I the opportunity to take charge and fight for our futures, but it has also empowered students and staff at Wooten High School to pursue environmental stewardship in their everyday lives. My team and I monitored the bins for around two weeks, assisting students with sorting their food waste. Now, as it's been almost two months since the program started, students are able to sort their waste correctly without guidance, reducing the amount of waste that goes into garbage cans. This self-sustaining process encourages students to participate in green habits and care for the environment. This starts a ripple effect as students bring these habits home to their parents and inspire environmental change. Our composting program has motivated other schools to start programs as well, as in the past two months, I've had students from four schools across Montgomery County reach out to my team and I at Wooten High School. They express interest in starting a program at their own school to reduce the amount of food waste that goes to incinerators. What started as a composting program at Wooten High School has helped to further spread the movement to reduce food waste in Montgomery County. Thank you for your time. Yeah, and I just want to point out that the compostology team has been doing great work since 2018. They started out in Clarksburg, all organically, on their own. And um, they are, you know, working with, with a, a, a web of county and statewide partners to uh, lobby all kinds of initiatives to help the county itself achieve its climate goals with regard to food waste recycling. And so what the school system does, the county does. And it all, but it all started with, with students. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Shristi Amula, and I'm a junior at Richard Montgomery High School. And in 2019, I founded Rise and Shine Foundation, a nonprofit organization with a main goal to reduce food waste in our community through composting and food recovery. So kind of what you mentioned, so when we were in 2018, so when I was in seventh grade, I um, worked with Compostology, and we opened the first composting program at County MCPS at Clarksburg Elementary School, who was able to get green certified because of this program. The first few schools I started composting programs at were fully funded by grants. Having external grants funding the schools is an unsustainable system as you don't know whether or not you're actually going to receive the money, and it's extremely time consuming, especially as a student, as you need to be constantly applying for different grants. So for now, I have shifted my focus to start composting at schools who have enough money to self-fund these programs in the hopes I can show you, the county, and the state the number of schools who are interested in composting and the positive effects it has on the environment in the hopes that we can get funding in the future, especially for schools who are in lower income areas in Title I schools, especially because they're disproportionately affected by climate change. So since then, I've expanded the composting program to eight different schools across the county, with an additional one starting after spring break and the entire Old New cluster starting soon as well. And one of my favorite parts about my composting journey is seeing it spread. I've had various students, staff, and administration come up to me telling me that they've begun composting at home. And principals tell me that their previous students who had already graduated started composting at their next school. It is truly inspiring to see these students apply this new idea in other aspects of their lives and see them build new green habits. I've also had around 60 schools across our county talk to me with interest to start their own program, but they just didn't have funding for it. And teachers from even other counties talk to me because they want to apply composting at their own schools. So it was really amazing to see this movement spread across the state. Through the composting schools, I noticed that a significant amount of the food that the students were trying to compost were completely unopened and uneaten. And something I was already doing outside the schools through my nonprofit was food recovery. Because in grocery stores, restaurants, and bakeries, they throw out the food before it actually goes bad. I recovered their food that they would otherwise just throw away and instead donated it to community members who actually need the food through homeless shelters and food pantries. So I wanted to apply the same concept in our school system. So I approached the MCPS Division of Sustainability and Compliance, and we are now partnered to bring this initiative to schools across the county. We started our first program at Burns Burtonsville Elementary School in 2022 and have since expanded it to 39 schools across our county. We have a share cart and a mini fridge put inside the cafeteria for the food that students aren't going to eat. And the cart is then wheeled around the school throughout the day so that students have the extra opportunities to take food and they could even take it home as well. Um, so it's especially helpful for both food shy and food insecure students. Thank you so much for your time. Just saying, this is why you know at our, uh, this is why the school system needs to build funding for composting and food recovery into the budget. And uh, the compostology students presented us with a pretty reasonable budget to expand. Um, and I do think this is just an ongoing conversation. 
I, definitely I just wanted to add, you know, the refrigerator at the school, the little mini fridge, and in the in the cafeteria has been a benefit um, because before the students would just throw uneaten food away, you know, apples or whatever, or the fruit, um, even sandwiches and some salads, they just throw them away. And now they are cognizant that if they don't want it, they'll put it in the fridge. We don't even tell them, and then other students will come up, and then at the end of the day for our after-school activities, um, if we have students that are still hungry and they haven't, you know, sports players or whatever, they'll actually walk by the fridge, grab some apples, and go out to practice. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely an amazing program, and we're glad to have it at Redland. I'd also add, like to add on the food recovery piece, it, it became strikingly apparent the food insecurity in the county and I, the food recovery piece is one of the things that's so critical because the food requires greenhouse gas emissions to be generated right it's packaged it ships to the schools so we, we should be using that food for its intended purposes of eating it and so we've been working very you know to make sure that the schools like you know where there's no funding for composting because composting is expensive it also generates greenhouse gases um, but the food recovery has so many win, 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 wins to it that, um, again, trying to make sure that we've got these food recovery programs. And I know that we don't know all the schools that are doing food recovery programs because before we even started this officially, I would go out to schools and they would tell me about the programs that they were doing. But the amazing thing about most of these programs is almost all of that food is consumed within that school community. It doesn't get donated somewhere else. It's just, it's not the right time of the day for them to eat it. So later on in the day, like Mr. Niper said, somebody's hungry and they want to eat it. So it's, it's just, you know, let's get it out of the trash and consume it. That's the most important part of this one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Rishi Iyer, and I'm a junior at Wooten High School. I have created a carbon footprint website that calculates the carbon emissions for schools and MCPS. It is modeled after the EPA, which has a similar website for households. And it's split into three sections. It's by transportation, which is like the school buses, energy, natural gas, and electricity, and waste, which is by the waste types like yard waste or solid waste, and the waste management practices like recycling, composting, and landfills. And uh, I created a baseline from the 2018-2019 school year, which was the last full school year with data, and for, for all the MCPS schools. At the local level for Wooten High School, I've established a carbon footprint uh, baseline and with that, I've identified areas for CO2 reduction. Like, for example, if the transportation emissions are high, there could be more electric buses. And if the energy emissions are high, they could get a new HVAC system. And similarly, if the waste is high, start increasing recycling or composting. And once new data is available, I plan to track the Wooten carbon footprint over the next few years. And based on if there's like increased emissions or reduction emissions, we can adapt from that. Some challenges that I've faced is I'm not the best programmer, so it was tough to code the website alone. <laughs> and I hit a roadblock, but I was introduced to the Youth Creating Change Group, and they uh, mentored me and, and let me apply for a grant, and I received it, and I was able to hire a web consultant that um, made the website more user-friendly and efficient. And how, how can this be applied to other MCPS schools? Other schools can not only track their carbon footprint, but also use it to make changes to reduce their footprint. So like if their transportation was high, like electric buses, as I said earlier, but they could even increase their carpoolers and walkers and reduce the dependency on buses, which would reduce emissions and uh, get people to school. Uh, this could also maybe even be applied to the green school certification process, because if schools, um, Schools that are green school certified, if they had, could have like a 5% reduction in emissions in the next year, that could keep their title. And certified schools will have like three years to make up for any deficiency in one year before they get rele relegated to non-certified schools. And throughout the year, students and administrators can work together and brainstorm ideas that could reduce CO2 emissions. And a school that finishes first can be rewarded with the green school excellence title. And to keep that title, you gotta just keep on reducing your emissions. And yeah, that's all for me, thank you. Can I come? Um, I'm just always so inspired by, by our young people and so hopeful. So uh, my other hat that I wear is I started the Up County Hub, which is a food insecurity nonprofit when the pandemic started. So we do a lot of um, food rescuing. Um, because like you, uh, there's just so much waste that goes on and there's so many of our neighbors who are truly, truly having a hard time. And you would think that food insecurity is getting better, 
but in the last year we have seen an increase of 20 percent so it's not getting better so anything that you're doing to do that to make that impact is awesome so thank you um and i see my son's old principal mr derby in the audience he was the principal of cedar grove when when marco who actually got married last october was eight years old and I used to volunteer in the cafeteria and we started our own little food, you know, food recovery at Cedar Grove because it was just so much waste that kids, you know, sometimes they would not eat it. It was, they, it was not even touched, right? They would just throw it away and, and it hurt me so badly. So we would keep some of that stuff at a table. It was like a common table, right? And some of the teachers would, would use those snacks for later for kids who were hungry because we do have um, a lot of people in our county that are truly hurting. So you guys gave me so much hope, so thank you. I wanted to ask Emily, you mentioned there were four schools that contacted you locally, but you didn't say who they were. I am, I'm interested to know the names of those schools. Yes, yeah, so they were Churchill, Walter Johnson, Northwest, and the last one's slipping my brain. Okay, you can always send me a little email. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I just really appreciate the commodity that you are showing to help others as you. Um, you know, it, this is not something that you're just doing at your school, but you're taking, you're being such an ambassador to ensuring that, you know, that other students are doing this as well. And Rashi, I'm just so impressed with you. You know, um, we're going to offer through the Up County Hub a coding program for young people. It's, I know nothing about coding, but I'm told it's, it's the Python model, which apparently helps with all kinds of website designs and, and all that. So if you're interested, we're going to do that over the summer with kids who really are interested. It's it's also part of our model to ensure that kids learn, um, you know, to, to empower them to do what, you, what you're doing, right? Um, but again, I want to take it to us, right, the adults. So we are supposed to um, be the models for the young people, and we're supposed to set the ex example. Yeah, it's all flipped now. <laughs> and I just, you know, I really, really, really want us to encourage our system. We are the largest uh, consumers uh, of electricity and so on in the county, right? We are. The young people are taking the uh, just the initiative, and 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 you guys are such warriors, right? And persistent um, in doing, like you say, you know, they said no, and you went back again, and you were like, no, we need to do this. So it, it hurts me to hear that you know, two hundred dollars a month hmm. prevents you from making such important changes in our environment that we know we need to change the patterns on. So someone who's been married to an environmentalist for 30 years, we recycle air, okay? We recycle everything. <laughs> Nothing gets by in our house, right? We're a solar house, we're like, you name it, we're the first in our neighborhood. You name it, we do it all. But um, I just want to ensure that, you know, as a system, we really, Mr. Hall, look into this and, and see how we can do funding for, for some of these, these initiatives for these young people, especially, who have the passion, who have the time and the commitment, because it's not just for them, right? It's for all of us. It's for the whole environment. It's for every member of this county who lives and breathes in this community. It has a direct impact. And I love the elementary school aspect because, you know, those elementary school the little people are just like little sponges, right? And then once, you know, you, you teach them those values, they take them with them, and then they become you, which is, which is great. Um, but when they become you, I want us to make sure that we can support you and support your initiatives, right? Because it's so important. So um, I think we're going to bring this back, right? We need, we're, we're going to do it. And so it's coming down the pike, Mr. Hall. Just giving you a heads up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the things about my personality and whatever is I'm a, I consider myself a fixer. So you have a problem, you need a solution, I'll do what I can to help, as we all do. But in listening to you guys talk, I, I think about so many of conversations that I've had with community members um, yesterday, and I have I have two meetings later after this meeting. Um, one is to talk about the uh, feed the fridge 
project that um, has kind of started. I'm going to be talking to Mr. Adams and uh, Superintendent um, Dr. McKnight um, about these things to later today. And um, trying to get that going, and that's a, um, a food recovery program as well, where we can they'll put fridges at, um, this nonprofit will put refrigerators at the schools, and then people can help themselves from the community and from the school to take food home with them or, or eat there. Um, and um, so that is somebody that I would love to, the uh, founder of that uh, nonprofit is somebody I'd love to introduce you to if you um, have the interest. Um, and another uh, community aspect that I've been kind of reaching out and communicating with is um, Covanta, which is the um, waste energy um, um, reusable energy plant um, out in Dickerson. And um, they're very interested in partnering with MCPS um, in terms of looking at ways of help supporting schools to do compost. Um, to do things um, like um, look at the, how they can help assist schools become green um, ribboned. And, um, and I do believe, having just sent a message and reached out, that they would likely help uh, financially as well in terms of making sure if it's $200 to, you know, to get one of your programs up and running, that seems like a um, something that we could figure, $200 a month, that seems like something that could be doable, if not just through them, through other community people who would be very interested in supporting these initiatives. It's incredible what you kids are doing. It's incredible the efforts that you're all going to to help support what the students are doing and to help make MCPS a greener, better place. I know we are all extremely appreciative, but um, I would really love to connect you all to these people that um, I just know, you know, they're in it for to make a difference as well and um, be supportive. And so um, I'd, we can reach out after the meeting or if you want to just send me a note or I'll give you guys my cell phone number so you can reach out to me. But I just wanted to thank you all for everything that you're doing. I appreciate it so much. So just a couple, oh, no, I don't, no, go ahead. I just wanted to say that I, I do believe they offer um, tours and field trips to that location because we've they, done that before. Correct. I was um, going to suggest that we put together a field trip for yeah. the group. <laughs> and also I think that a benefit, because if yes. we're looking to try to move to the 50% mark, which is the goal, right, to right. Move, move more of the schools up, yes. um, having time for the students of schools that maybe haven't, you know, gone through the certification to take some of these trips, yes. especially like on an Earth Day or, exactly. you know, so some in the, in the you know, in that month, it helps get students that maybe don't have the students that are so energetic that they haven't don't have the families that are like Correct. pushing them. They see it, they get excited, and maybe that gets us the push to get the extra 19, and then 30, and then 40, and then we're hitting 75 percent of the schools being green certified. So we want to, you know, I think that that's. But when you mentioned that, I was like, we've been there. Right? These kids loved it. They yeah. love seeing the process of how that happened, and, and the opportunities for them, for you all, to be able to work with them to expand and into other schools and um, potentially even do more on their property, I think is something that could be a reality, so. Really quick, I just wanted to say I'm so proud of you guys. Yes. And I, I felt as you were talking, I'm going to be another school that's going to reach out to all three of you. <laughs> Every one of those initiatives are things mm -hmm. that we definitely could bring to the elementary school. And I actually was reading um, um, in the Montgomery County show, uh, the, the the MoCo uh, Show. The MoCo Show. <laughs> they did an article about Burtonsville today, oh. and it listed the refrigerator and talked about that. So I just wanted to know, let you know. I just read it this morning. So nice. great work. Nice. Yeah. So I'm excited about that because I definitely want to bring um, all three of those initiatives to Paige. That would be all amazing. It. Yeah, so quick ask. So, Emily, so the compostology team, um, last week they uh, did a briefing on their work and their pro budget proposals and their proposal to get MCP, uh, the county to create a composting facility in the Ag Reserve to uh, uh, mm -hmm. Council President Glass, who chairs the Environment and Transportation Committee. And yesterday, 
they did a briefing with Councilmember Jawando, who chairs the, in, the Education and Culture Committee. So they're they're getting the word out. But if you could share the slideshow that you presented to them with with, with the board, so we could all, and, and everybody here, mm -hmm. so we can get that out and get that widely circulated, so people can see what you're doing, see all the schools you're already in, and the ones you're bringing online, and you know we can build the buzz that way. And then Rishi, sadly we didn't we weren't able to show your website, but that no. website is he's it's 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 done. It's proof of concept. He has created that thing from nothing, and there's data in there on every one of our 210 schools. We have 211th in the in the mm -hmm. in the fall, um, but that is a tool right now ready to be used. Anybody, me. I, you know, could go in and as long as you've got the data, you can input it into his website and you can get an immediate output mm -hmm. for what that school's carbon footprint is by the week, by the month, whatever you're looking at, that is a tool that is on board and ready to roll. So we've got these things and we want to give a shout out. And so we were talking to you about some of the, the ways that MCPS can fund and support some of these projects at schools. So. Shristi, you're on the steering committee. What was it we decided last week, we were, or the week before, that we were going to call this, this group of 12 students who are going to have real power and real authority inside the system that will include allocating some grant funds to student projects in schools? You asked for the name of it? <coughs> yeah. OK, I think it's the Student Sustainability Commission. Students, yep. So, and we are going to do a big reveal of that at what are you working on planning, Emily? <laughs> the Youth Climate Summit. <laughs> <laughs> on April 22nd at Tilden Middle School. And we will be doing a big reveal about the, the Student Sustainability Commission and how students can apply to be on there and what that job, we are still coming up with a full vision, duties, responsibilities of that group, but they will be in part. And it, you know, submitting, you know, issuing an RFP for students across the system to submit proposals for sustainability projects at their schools that this group will be able to fund and, and give grants for. So that's one way we're starting baby steps to fund some of these uh, these amazing projects throughout the schools. But it's all being driven by the students. And then, you know, again, we need to be looking at how we are, you know, show me your budget. Show you your priorities. Mm -hmm. So how we are building into our budget the work to support the sustainability across the system. It goes to the way we teach, the way we learn, the way we create healthy school environments, the way we create a, a, what does our new sixth grade science curriculum say? We are, we are, the, the goal is to create climate warriors. And, and that's what, you know, mm -hmm. this work will do. So I, I see opportunities everywhere. And, you know, again, Emily, share that the PowerPoint with all of us so we can also scale that up and show it to other people like the Coventa program so they can see what you're doing and you know that's how those partnerships are built. I'm not sure I have everybody's contact information, so can I forward it to you? To okay, perfect. yeah, and I will submit it far and wide. Thank you. <laughs> she knows where to find us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and then you know, cheers to the folks inside the system that are seeing real value in partnering mm -hmm. with these students and what they're bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we are way over time, but I just really yeah. so appreciate that we continue it to highlight so worth it. so the worth work. It. So yep. Worth yep. It. yep, yep, yep. Cheers. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. And then I guess next time we'll do an update on what we're doing as far as energy yeah. and uh, indoor air quality work, which is, a, again, how we create healthy schools. Mm -hmm. But anyway, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you for thank being you. here, principals. Thank you for your work, um, creating that culture. Thank you, students. Can't say it enough. Thank you, MCPS, for you seeing value in what these students are doing and bringing that energy. And, you know, we're, we're going to transform this school system. We're adjourned. Absolutely.